Good evening. At this time, I'd like to call to order the Planning Commission meeting of April 12th, 2021. For viewers watching at home, all commissioners and the public are participating via video conference or teleconference to assist the city in our social distancing efforts. Please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> when we get the flag down, will the secretary please call roll? Thank you. Commissioner Buss? Present. Commissioner Link? Present. Commissioner McMahon? Present. Commissioner Newman? Present. Commissioner Lanson, and sorry, that was Chair Buss. President for Thank you. No problem. Threw me off going first, though. Um, <clears throat> Planning Division Manager Finley, uh, are there any written comments, announcements, or continuances at this time? Yes, good evening, and thank you, Chair Buss. Um, several correspondence items were received on agenda item number 7A and provided to the Planning Commission um, one last Thursday and then earlier um, or later this afternoon in supplemental packets. And there are no additional announcements concerning tonight's agenda item. Thanks. Okay. Um, <clears throat> looking ahead on the agenda and seeing that items 8A and 8B uh, B should be relatively quick matters, um, I'd like to reorder the agenda so that we hear the two department reports prior to the public hearing. Just so everybody knows. But first, uh, we can go on to public comments. Now is the time for public comment. At this time, any person may address the commission regarding a city planning matter that is not on this evening's agenda. Should the commission wish to discuss an issue raised by a member of the public, the issue will be referred to uh, staff for a scheduling on a future agenda. Anyone who would like to speak under the public comments must complete a speaker card and file it with the recording secretary before the public comments portion of the agenda is called. The speaker's remarks should be addressed to, a, to the commission as a whole and not to an individual commissioner or staff member. Unless otherwise provided by the commission, speakers are limited to five minutes. The monitor in front of you will show you the remaining time you have. Secretary Gore, I believe we do not have any public speakers tonight, correct? I had one, Andre Baselia. He may have meant to sign up for 7A. Copy that. Um, then I will defer to uh, Andre Baselia. Andre. He's not Mr. present. Mr. Baselli is not present? Correct. Okay. Well, maybe we'll try to come back to him in 7A just to double check. All right. Then we'll move on. Next, um, we have the consent calendar with the minutes of March 29th, 2021. Do any of my fellow commissioners have any comments or a motion to approve the minutes? I would move to approve the minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Secretary, will you please prepare us for a vote? Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner Link? Aye. Commissioner McMahon? Yes. Commissioner Newman? Aye. Chair Buss? Aye. All right, moving on. Uh, next Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, next we have Department Report 8A, the presentation on the Climate and Environmental Action Plan to be presented by Senior Sustainability Analyst John Brooks. John Brooks. Good yeah, let me a second and I'll share my screen here. Okay, it looks like you're seeing the screen okay. Good evening, I'm John Brooks. I'm here this evening to provide information on the development of the city's Climate and Environmental Action Plan, or CAP, and its relationship to the general plan update. In 2014, the city conducted an extensive community engagement campaign to develop a future vision for the city. One of the top 10 guiding principles selected by the community was a commitment to environmental leadership and the development of a climate action plan. In addition, city council has set the development of the sustainability strategic plan as one of its top 10 priorities and the climate and environmental action plan is among the top 10 priorities for the next two years that the council identified at the March 30th planning meeting. 
And here we show the elements of the Climate and Environmental Action Plan. Our goal is to develop this plan in parallel with the general plan this year so that they are aligned and mutually supportive. Those components shown in here in the dark green have already been completed. The light green are in process, are been developed, and the blue boxes are the additional components that we're working on now to complete the CAP. The CAP will detail the strategies and actions that the city will take to pursue will pursue to protect the environment and address the challenges of climate change. Actions will be aimed at improving overall public health, sustaining a healthy environment, reducing air pollution, protecting our energy supply, mitigating climate change and its impacts, and supporting a healthy economy into the future. So what is a CAP? It's a plan to assist the state in meeting its goals, express community of values, and incorporate multiple environmental objectives into one document. But we do get to establish our own targets. A CAP are, really equals a CAP, a climate action plan, which many of you may be familiar with, but it also includes other environmental issues. For instance, we have had stakeholder members suggest adoption of a dark skies ordinance, or some have suggested an ordinance to eliminate gas-powered landscaping equipment. Those would not be substantial contributors to reducing overall greenhouse gases, but they would affect our environmental quality of life. So climate policy in California uh, started out with AB 32 in 2006, which set California's first greenhouse gas target to reduce emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. And in 2016, SB 32 extended those goals and established a 2030 goal of reducing emissions 40% below 1990 levels and a 2050 goal of further reduction emissions by 80%. In addition, in 2018, an executive order established the target of carbon neutrality by 2045. A critical starting point for the CAP is the development of the citywide greenhouse gas inventory, which documents the quantity of emissions of so-called greenhouse gases, or GHGs, that are responsible for climate change. Sources include both GHG emissions that the city has direct control over, and those that result from community activities, which are directly and indirectly impacted by local government programs, implementation of state mandates, planning, and development decisions. And in the chart, you can see the breakdown of community-wide GHG emissions by source for the most recent year for which we have complete data. Transportation makes up approximately 50% of community emissions, followed by electricity at 22% and natural gas at 15%, with minor sources such as refrigerants, HFC, HFCs and PFCs, waste and water treatment following. Electricity emissions were substantially reduced in 2019 and again in 2020 due to the city council's decision to switch to Clean Power Alliance as the community's default provider at 100% renewable energy, which occurred in early 2019. We estimate that electricity emissions will be only 3% of total community greenhouse gas emissions for 2020. Significant strides have been made in reducing community emissions over the past decade, even as the city's population has grown, with 2018 emissions 13.5% lower than 2010 values. This reduction is primarily due to energy conservation, a transition to more renewable energy, and improved vehicle fuel efficiency. This chart shows historical and future community greenhouse gas emissions based on a business as usual model, i.e. it's assuming that no specific further mitigation actions are taken by the city or the state. Transportation making up approximately 50% is shown in orange in the bottom. The yellow is electricity, natural gas and brown, followed by the more minor sources up here. The reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from electricity that resulted in 2019 from the community's switch to Clean Power Alliance at 100% renewable is very evident. You can see it kind of falling off the cliff here and just a dramatic reduction. In this business as usual scenario, emissions are projected to be 28% below 2010 values by 2030 and remain fairly steady, trending roughly with population thereafter. 
Since electricity emissions reductions have largely been realized, the remaining ways to achieve significant further reductions are to address the other major emission sources, namely transportation and natural gas use. Staff have been engaging the community in discussions of possible strategies to address emissions from these sources through a number of different activities for the past eight months or so. Public outreach started with in-person events like the Rotary Fair and Amgen events, et cetera, but COVID made us virtual like everyone else in the process. So we did advertise the development of the plan at our stakeholder meetings in the ACORN through social media. And we've been developing our online presence for the last decade and that's really uh, helped us out as we made this online transition. So here is an illustration of uh, this e-newsletter we put out. This is our January e-newsletter that was sent out to over 10,000 uh, residents. Um, we had about a 42% open rate and a 23% click rate. And you can see here, choose your future city, Thousand Oaks 2045. Uh, some of you may recognize that. We we're helping to advertise the general plan. And down here we have climate pl planning in the city get involved. And both of these uh, at the end of the article reference the other planning exercise so people realized how they uh, link together and create a more collaborative process. Whoop, I think I clicked a little too farther. Uh, the stakeholders have been participating in a series of four stakeholder meetings on various topics of the CAP. These stakeholder meetings have been well attended by the public with between 60 and 100 participants at each. Active discussions, polls, and Q&A have taken place throughout. In addition, a community-wide public meeting will be held this summer to present draft strategies for public input. And staff from the Community Development Department have been actively participating in these meetings. The large majority of respondents through the surveys want the city to set greenhouse gas emission reduction targets aligned with the state goal, 40% by 2030 and 80% by 2050. And these are the reductions necessary to avoid catastrophic warming as projected by scientists throughout the world and align with those of other countries. Council agreed and established these as the minimum preliminary targets for the plan. Half the respondents believe that we should be even more aggressive than that. In addition, 55% of respondents believe that we should be aggressive in new building energy standards. So I'll present a couple of examples of how the CAP and the general plan fit together. For example, in looking at transportation emissions, a goal within the general plan might be to reduce the vehicle miles traveled, also referred to as VMT frequently, as an outcome. And to do that, we could have a couple strategies here like providing improved amenities for transit riders, provide a connected bike and pedestrian network, or pursue mixed use compact development in appropriate locations. All the strategies in the CAP do not necessarily need to be implemented. It's a working document that will be reviewed and updated every few years. The implementation of strategies ongoing as their feasibility is addressed. Here's a second example of a desired outcome that be, could be incorporated into a general plan policy, uh, reducing building energy emissions. And here's some potential strategies, energy efficiency requirements for remodels, requiring heat pumps for pool heating in new pools, a reach code to require all new construction to be electric only or electric preferred, and maximize participation in the Clean Power Alliance at the 100% clean power level. None of the strategies have been decided. These are options that have been discussed in the stakeholder meetings, but the June meeting will be when the public will have the opportunity to weigh in on potential strategies. So the general plan can incorporate policies to support the CAP strategies, especially those related to land use and transportation. Future ERs, EIRs for new development projects will be able to take advantage of the wide range of GHG mitigation measures included in the CAP. And completing CEQA on the CAP allows for streamlining and tiering of individual pro uh, projects consistent with the CAP. For example, under the CAP, the greenhouse gas savings for all electric construction will be modeled. 
a developer can incorporate those findings by reference into their proposed project and thus save the city's planning department from having to conduct a separate CEQA analysis on that issue. And the CAP will be able to undergo the CEQA process at the same time as the general plan, and they're going to use a consistent set of baseline conditions and growth assumptions to ensure that they're uh, mutually supportive. So here's an example of the uh, timeline that we're working with uh, coming up on May, where we're developing our comprehensive list of strategies uh, to present at the forum coming up here in June. Uh, in this summer, there'll be a computation of the greenhouse gas savings from potential strategies that the public has weighed in on. And as those measures or strategies are being developed, we'll submit for the CEQA process, uh, allowing us to develop a draft uh, CAP in September for the public to review and the council to get an initial look at, uh, with the idea that by the end of the year, will go to uh, council for adoption. So you can find more information at the link shown uh, below or register for upcoming meetings. And thank you, that concludes my presentation. I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brooks, for such a wonderful presentation. I now defer to my fellow council members uh, for any questions you might have. I am flying slightly blind. I'm gonna start with uh, Mr. Newman. Thank so, you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Brooks, for your presentation. I uh, wanted to ask about a personal hobby horse of mine. Uh, as you know, I'm in favor of banning internal combustion engines in leaf blowers and other small um, landscaping appliances in the city. I realized that uh, doing so would not be a significant reduction in greenhouse gases citywide, but it would definitely improve the health of the person using that appliance. And it would also, uh, this also touches our noise element of our general plan and would re result in a noise reduction for the user and in the immediate surroundings. So I, my question is, how can we include this in the CAP and what, what's the prognosis for this moving forward? Uh, Yes, so that is a, that's come up several times. Uh, there, there's, uh, you're not the only one interested in, in those issues. And we'll actually be discussing it at our upcoming uh, planning uh, stakeholder meeting on April 28th. And people could go to the link and register for that meeting and, and weigh in on the subject. Uh, and progro prognosis, um, we will be discussing it, but you know, it certainly is up to the community and then uh, engaging the council to make sure they're supportive of the plan. But as, as I mentioned, uh, we have had multiple stakeholders also interested and some members of the public uh, through our prior stakeholder presentations, meetings have uh, also indicated interest in, in that effort. And I think uh, overall, as you're aware, uh, some other communities, including the city of Ojai, have already adopted a strategy, and that was led by uh, one of their city council members who happens to be a professional landscape, uh, has a professional landscape business. And at that point, he deemed uh, the equipment both adequate to do the job that needed to be done and cost effective enough that they supported moving to uh, that position, and I think that might be three or four years ago. Uh, so it is being done in some other communities. So I, I, I think uh, it's quite possible that uh, the council would be supportive in, in our community as well. Thanks for that. And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing this move forward. That's all I have, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Newman. Uh, Commissioner Lansing. Thank you, Chair Buss, and thank you, Mr. Brooks, for your report. I just uh, had just a few questions. Um, I think in looking at the staff report, the information about the emissions, was it through 2019, so we don't know what 2020 numbers are yet? No, and we'll definitely be asterisking those in the future. <laughs> it's just gonna be very, very different and hard to draw a lot of conclusions from 2020 data. 
I, again, considering, as you said, some of our, uh, the highest level is for transportation. And I'm curious to see how the effect of the last year would affect that number going forward. We're going to be very interested too. And uh, certainly, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion in kind of my industry about what, what it's going to look like in the future. Um, and many of us suspect that uh, there will continue to be a lot of teleworking and it's going to change our commuting pattern significantly much more than we would have ever anticipated uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, do, do you think the results from 2020 will be available before uh, the city council may finally vote on the general plan update? No, I don't think that. Um, it takes a while. I, I'll have to I'll have to see, but I'm not sure that that does well. I, I, again, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not pushing. I'm just saying it would be an yeah. interesting piece of information to get an actual real life, you know, test, so to speak, of what would happen if we had a lot less cars in the road in terms of those numbers. Yeah, and there may be some preliminary numbers on that, but we do collect from a lot of different sources, uh, so I'm not sure if if that data will be available by then. Understood. Uh, the, the new standards that you referenced, um, the city hasn't yet adopted those. They're going to do that as part of the general plan update process. Uh, which standards are you, you referencing? You, you, I'm uh, sorry, you mentioned state had issued a number of different uh, standards. Right. Well, those are actually goals. So the 40 percent below uh, 1990 levels by 2030 and 80 below by uh, 2050. Those are actually goals. They're not mandates for the community, but the city council at the January 12th meeting did uh, kind of set that as the floor that we should be shooting for and, and we should try and exceed those levels. So the city council has uh, asked staff to uh, develop strategies that would help the community exceed these state's goals. And again, I just is that would that go as part of one of the elements or just the general plan process as well, or would it be independent of that in terms of adopting those? Uh, it would be part of the Climate Environmental Action Plan, but I think it would be integrated into the uh, general plan, but I would defer to uh, Community Development Department staff on that, how, how they get integrated into the different components. But there is certainly a lot of overlap. Just trying to get to figure out how it all yeah. fits in together in terms of how it's looked at. So that was all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lanson. Um, Commissioner McMahon, Commissioner Link, any questions? Oh, thank you. I'm getting head nods. So I just had uh, one quick follow up on this. Um, this is the second uh, meeting that we've had where we're talking about things in the general plan and public community outreach. And uh, yeah, the ACORN has been referenced both times as kind of the primary source of contact for, for residents. Um, great shout out to the ACORN. It is our local paper and a, a great source of community news. Um, but I wanted to make sure that uh, we all understand that the ad buys that are happening there are only for the, the print option. Um, when you read an article online through the ACORN, those ads are actually driven by Google. And so I just want to make sure that the city's aware that when you're doing an ad buy, you're only buying for the print as opposed to the print and online. And the other thing I wanted to uh, make you aware of is that uh, ACORN's delivery isn't universal throughout the city itself. It is uh, primarily to uh, single family homes. And so we do not, uh, they don't have a door to door delivery in the um, any of the apartment buildings, uh, significant number of the gated communities, condos. So I just wanna make sure the city is aware of, the, of, of what's being distributed and who you're getting it to. Um, so I just wanna make that quick comment before we move on. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, noted. Thank you. All right. I appreciate your uh, your uh, very thorough report, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Brooks. Thank you for uh, inviting us. AB, uh, we'll be moving on to the department report AB, uh, consistency of the capital, uh, city capital improvement program, CIP, for fiscal years 2021 and 22, and 22, uh, 2022 and 2023, with the Thousand Oaks General Plan presented by Senior Planner Ian Holt. Mr. Holt, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Just give me a moment here. All right, can everyone see that? Yes. All right, so um, so yeah, as um, uh, 
Chair Buss stated, uh, we basically have the uh, general plan consistency review of the capital improvement program for the next two fiscal years. Um, I would like to note um, tonight, I also have uh, Brent Sakaida uh, here. He's a budget officer, Liz Perez, facilities manager, as well as uh, Nader Hadari, who's the deputy public works director and city engineer. And they would be available to answer any questions regarding any of the projects or the budget associated with the CIP. <clears throat> so um, as a bit of background, uh, the CIP um, basically includes uh, short-term projects for the next two fiscal years, as well as some long-term projects that are funded over a longer period of time. Um, it's organized into 11 project categories, um, basically dealing with uh, facilities, housing, landscape, streetscape, library, open space, stormwater, street, transportation, traffic, undergrounding, wastewater, and water. <clears throat> so uh, the Planning Commission's review, it's uh, required under California Government Code Section 65401, uh, basically that the Planning Commission needs to report on the consistency of any public works project in relation to the adopted general plan. And um, our evaluation uh, basically took a look at all the different project categories for the next two fiscal years and looked at the overarching uh, general plan goals as well as the individual goals and policies contained within each of the general plan elements. So um, first off um, is the group is the facility projects. Um, we'll just kind of quickly touch upon some of those, but uh, we have re rehabilitation upgrades to the variety of uh, city facilities, including the CAP, uh, teen and adult centers, transportation centers, as well as the golf course, and of course, the municipal service center. Um, also, there is um, part of the money is um, assistance to CRPD for the construction of the Caneo Creek Southwest project. And that project is going to be split 50-50. Um, uh, Fifty percent of that is actually going to be paid via the Quimby fees that have been collected by CRPD through uh, development in the city. And so these projects um, all um, basically are consistent with the general plans goal as far as providing an overall framework for a planned and unified community, um, providing a balance of um, facilities throughout, as well as um, providing and maintaining park and recreation facility. And then other elements such as our social element dealing with quality services and programs and um, also our public element, public buildings element as well. Um, so another category is we have housing projects and actually um, this has not been included in, in the most recent years within the CIP. Um, and prior to the dissolution of the re redevelopment agency, it was typically um, included in the CIP, but um, this year it's been reintroduced um, partly due to um, the need for housing and also uh, reinforced by the uh, city council's goal setting just this past week. Um, so uh, as part of that, um, you know, the money can be used for a variety of priorities, um, you know, including permanent supportive housing, emergency home shelters, contributions to land trusts and affordable housing. Um, there's no specific projects identified at this time, but having the money set aside actually put is it advantageous to the city, especially when the city's um, seeking uh, grant opportunities. So um, that could be very helpful as far as our um, upcoming general plan update, as well as just um, being consistent with our current goals as far as providing a balance of adequate housing throughout the um, community for all, you know, age, income levels, ethnic backgrounds, and so forth, um, income, and also special needs populations. So this slide, um, we've just uh, kind of coupled together the landscape, streetscape, and then the street projects um, on one. Uh, you know, the landscape, streetscape are typically those kind of um, community enhancement or beautification projects, such as Thousand Oaks Boulevard uh, streetscape improvements. You also have Westlake Boulevard uh, landscape improvements. 
and also um, some rehabilitation and planting of oak trees up in Zuniga Ridge, as well as um, replacing trees and landscaping damage via the um, Woolsey fire. And those are you know, all consistent with both our overarching general plan call policy as far as preserving the spaciousness and the attractiveness of um, Thousand Oaks, as well as circulation element and conservation element and the scenic highway element policies. Um, our street, oh, I should also mention our forestry element. And then, you know, as far as street, those are typically the types of projects that are associated with um, uh, circulation. So more of the roadway improvements, you know, construction, widening, rehabilitation, um, and a variety of other kind of modifications and construction to help um, create the circulation patterns through the various modes. So those are all consistent with both our general plan um, overall goal for integrated circulation and transportation systems, as well as um, circulation element policies and our safety element policies as well. Next, we have coupled together the library and open space projects. Um, there's a variety of um, library system upgrades, whether it's fire alarm or public address systems, uh, lighting, and also a variety of and interior remodels for both of the um, libraries. In terms of, open, and those are consistent with both our obvious, uh, our public element, public building element, as well as our social element goal. And then we have a variety of open space projects um, where we're acquiring land that have open space resources and also a variety of trail improvements to the newly acquired open space. Um, approximately a little bit over 80 hours, 80 acres, I should say. And then the variety of uh, typical renovation and construction pro projects within the open space, all trail related. And then one of the more significant projects being the grid bridge construction across the rail Caneo Creek down at, by the Hall Canyon treatment plant. Next, we have a uh, transportation and traffic projects. Um, these include a variety of um, modifications to transportation centers, other bus shelter enhancements, uh, traffic signal infrastructure upgrades, freeway interchange up improvements, restriping, um, and uh, improvements to bus in infrastructure, as well as a variety of uh, safety features for um, pedestrians and bikes. And again, those are all consistent with uh, general plan overarching goals, as well as circula circulation and safety element policies. Then we have the variety of uh, wastewater and water projects. So um, uh, the focus on that uh, for the wastewater um, is primarily on the Hall Canyon treatment plant um, and also the implementation of its master plan and um, and then in terms of water supply, just the overarching ongoing efforts to ensure viable and dependable water short, uh, storage and distribution system, as well as the repair and replacement of upgrade of those existing infrastructure, as well as a, um, a groundwater utilization project that's um, under going right now. So other projects, um, we have uh, undergrounding of overhead power and communications facilities that's consistent with our scenic highways element policy coordinating program um, to kind of remove those from those scenic corridors. And in terms of stormwater, um, you know, basically uh, addressing and managing uh, the collection of stormwater runoff, as well as the variety of improvements to those facilities, all to help support um, our safety element goals to make sure that those facilities are, um, you know, meeting the ongoing performance that's needed, as well as protecting um, uh, flood damage. So um, just real quick, um, just at the end of last month, as far as the timeline, um, the City Council uh, Capital Facilities Subcommittee reviewed this proposed CIP. Uh, tonight, uh, the Planning Commission, we're asking you to review for pl general plan consistency. 
tomorrow night will be followed by the city council study session on the proposed CIP with the anticipated uh, public hearing and adoption in June 8th this year for the final CIP. So with that, um, staff's recommendation is that the Planning Commission finds that the proposed capital improvement program for the next two fiscal years is consistent with the Thousand Oaks General Plan and then th that this finding be conveyed to the City Council. And that would conclude my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Senior Planner Holt. Uh, do any of my fellow commissioners have any questions? Or a motion? <laughs> uh, Commissioner McMahon. I did have a couple of questions um, at the beginning, uh, fairly into the, the beginning of this under residential policies. It was, um, it talks about an approximate housing mix of 80% single family units, 20% multiple family units. And, um, and that whole um, bullet point is that, that obviously was what was set as a goal way back when this was established. Is this what the goal still will be when we do our new general plan update? Or are we scrapping that and starting over with, because I know we've talked about, you know, affordable housing, we've talked about uh, the mixed use and all that. So is this part of it being scrapped and started, o started over? Well, um, it's not, I mean, we are evaluating this, yes, under the current um, general plan goals. Um, I think, you know, as far as revisiting that ratio of 80% single family to 20% multifamily, um, you know, that would be uh, a byproduct probably of the preferred land use alternative. Like what, you know, in terms of the types of housing types does that plan anticipate? Um, it, I would maybe just suggest that it gets adjusted. I, I'm not saying that it gets scrapped. I mean, um, and I mean, I don't have any of that information handy, but I mean, in past presentations for the general plan update, um, you know, the predominant housing type within Thousand Oaks is still, you know, single family and will very much remain so. Um, so, you know, as we're looking at addressing future housing needs, Possibly, yeah, that multifamily percentage goes up, but um, you know that's yet to be determined. I see. And then I, I, I hope you don't mind. Um, there was a phrase that was used here: um, density transfer procedures. I, I don't understand that phrase. Um, it I'm says sorry. it was. It says. Within steeper slope areas, clustering of single family units could be achieved through density transfer procedures while maintaining neighborhood compatibility. Oh, okay. Are, are you, you're looking at just the, the attachment to the staff report, correct? That has the oh, all the list of general plan goals and policies, correct? Exactly, yes. Okay, okay. Because I, I didn't, I, we didn't really cite any of those in terms of the CIP analysis. No, I was um, that's before you tonight. That. Yeah, all. so um, yeah, that is a you know a policy to allow the clustering of residential development in those to you know constrained lands that have you know topographical resources that need to be protected and so forth. So, um, so they would be denser in that in those areas. That's what you're. That's what that means. Correct. I mean. Um, and I mean, I think partly that is, you know, we're, we're getting into kind of zoning implementation tools and so forth. Um, and I mean, again, like the residential plan development zone allows that flexibility where you can concentrate development to the developable portions of the land if you preserve those other areas that are constrained, so. Okay, thank you. I have one last question and that's more of the gist of what you were talking about. And you're talking about the undergrounding, um, and and I don't know how much the city is emphasizing that. I was just kind of curious because, uh, to me, Potrero Road is a scenic corridor, and I wonder if that's anywhere on the list for undergrounding. I don't know uh, off the top of my head. Perhaps I can defer to um, Public Works. 
Yeah, that'd be my pleasure. This is Nadari Dari, city engineer. Good evening. Um, yeah, the, the Public Works Department is still proceeding forward based on a city council established list of undergrounding uh, master plan, which was from 1992. There was about 34 locations on there. About a third of them have been completed, including uh, Reno Road, Dallas North Boulevard, Hillcrest, Century Park Road, and several others. I don't believe Petrero is on there. Um, I, I can I can revisit that. Uh, I think I'll, maybe a part of that is because the majority of Petrero is maybe uh, unincorporated and maybe it's not as high of a traveled arterial as maybe some of those other streets. Uh, the ones that are still on the list, which are like, you know, looming potentially next are the remaining piece on Moore Park Road and Jans Road and a few other locations. But mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe I saw Petrero on that list previously. I might suggest that at least near Windy, where we've got the National Park, and there's a view, you know, of that beautiful area, that might be worthy of putting on the list. That's all. Um, just a comment. Um, and I'm done with my questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner McMahon. Um, uh, now that I got full view, uh, Commissioner Link, please. Thank you, Chair Buss. Uh, I have a couple of questions, actually, and I'm going to hit on uh, undergrounding as well. Are the projects uh, dependent upon the amount of funds available in Rule 20, or does the city contribute funding as well? Yes, so the Rule 20 is, yeah, is the Edison program, and there's three tiers. There's the tier that Edison does the project themselves, and uh, those are the Rule 20A projects, and those are the monies that Edison collects from the ratepayers, and eventually it builds up to a, to a level where they can go and do a, a, a larger community project. Those are you know few and far between because it's kind of a once every 20 years project. The previous one was the work that uh, they, the city was able to have them do on Moore Park Road up to Columbia. And that was phase one of that Moore Park undergrounding. The, the next piece would be from Columbia north all the way, I think, to Olson or thereabouts. And so that money, uh, that project was done about 15 years ago, but it still hasn't reached the, the fund hasn't reached the point where it will be able to fund another project. So, so that that's one piece, and that, those are those uh, occasional projects. Then there's Rule 20B projects where the uh, city is able to collaborate with the developer, and let's say a developer is doing a multifamily project, but it's only you know a few hundred foot of its frontage. We have some funds that we collect when uh, other developers cash out and we will we can team up and extend that undergrounding a certain distance and if it's over 600 feet and undergrounding both sides of the street then SCE provides some uh, rebates and some uh, tax credits which makes those projects a little more affordable and then 20c projects are on a project that uh, are done typically by a developer at his own expense without any uh, you know participation from the city so it's kind of all three measures that we've been pushing forward um, there is no general fund contribution toward undergrounding. The only funds that are in the account are those that are collected when a smaller project uh, cashes out or there it gets an under, uh, UUW, underground utility waiver. And so those are the funds we, we collect and we try to apply for a greater economy of scale on an arterial road. Makes sense. Uh, the follow-up question I had was with regard to uh, public safety power shutdowns and in light of the frequency and more than likely uh, no end in sight. The White Cliff circuit uh, seems to be the most affected and more than likely related to the overground or up aerial lines that extend up Erds Road on the east side, which is adjacent to, I think, one of our treatment or pumping locations, and I can't remember which, uh, but I imagine that's affected. So is there any consideration given to using that money for that, or is that in the, the capital project list for undergrounding? Yeah, so that's up near Olson. That's our Olson Road pump station. Maybe that's the one you're referring to. Um, the CIP budget, the, the draft CIP budget, does not specifically call out the locations of the undergroundings because it has to be a little bit dynamic to be able to uh, match up with the development projects and you know give us a kind of a better uh, bang for the buck if we're going to be doing that, that type of work. But that's a good comment there. We're still learning a lot about this. You know, PSPS. It's kind of a whole new thing, but you're right that certain circuits have, have been hit a lot worse than others. And we're just getting that data. I saw a few reports a few weeks ago that said, you know, X circuit had, you know, six shutoffs. And I think partially in response to that, SCE is going to be, or they're saying they're going to be a little sensitive to doing shutoffs to those same neighborhoods who had multiple shutoffs before. But but uh, that being said, we, we still should look at uh, focusing that in the in the right areas. And that, that's a good comment. We'll, we'll definitely take that into consideration. Appreciate it. 
Uh, and then the next, uh, I actually just had one question with regard to solid waste. Uh, I, I saw on the uh, capital project list that the source of funds for solid waste generally comes from service rates. And we show a reasonable amount of money in the bank, about four and a half million. So uh, is where is that money going to be going to? Because it looks like there's not a lot of projects and most of them related to the uh, the MSC. Yeah, the solid waste fund typically is not used for capital projects. So we can we can revisit that and see if that fund balance is really a solid waste that fund balance or if it's, if it's truly a solid waste capital project uh, balance. So we can look into that. It, it likely may not be uh, intended just for, for capital projects. We are doing a few projects here and there. We're doing our first city owned solar project at the MSC right now. And there may be a few other ones going on, but uh, in general, those are not, uh, you know, funded in great, great part by the uh, solid waste enterprise, unless there's a, there's a nexus, which in the MSC there is because of the HHW facility there. All right, excellent. That was all I had appreciated. Oh, and uh, again, I wanted to extend my uh, appreciation and I, I neglected prior, but uh, for the study sessions that we had on, on Friday, I greatly appreciate it and uh, certainly consolidates the number of questions that I have before we get to this meeting. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Lee. Uh Commissioner Newman, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Holt. I just had uh, one question about the scope of what's before us this evening. Um, when you began your presentation, you spoke about uh, short-term and long-term components of this capital improvement program. And I just want to confirm that the question before us this evening is relatively short-term, namely the next two years fiscal budgets. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, it is primarily the funding for the next two years. So that funding for that two year time frame includes both the short term projects, but then I believe partial funding for the five year program projects, but not the full entirety of that. Right, right. So we may be we may be approving or recommending, I'm not sure which, uh, monies spent as far out as 2023, but we are not um, approving this evening anyway, monies that might be spent in 2024 or beyond. Yeah, um, and Commissioner Newman, if I may, um, just to correct you, you're you're not approving the funding here tonight. You are essentially providing a recommendation as far as the capital improvement program and its consistency with the general plan goals and policies. So, um, you know, the monies being appropriated to each project and so forth is is not before you tonight. Yeah, thank you. That's a good clarification. But again, coming back to the scope question, the um, consistency that we're being asked to consider is is constrained in scope to 2023 and not beyond. Is that correct? It's for those projects that fall within those two fiscal years. So those are inclusive of two-year short-term projects as well as five-year long-term projects and their proportion. So two-fifths, if it's a five-year long project, you're approving the consistency that the two-year portion of that five-year long project is consistent with the general right. plan. Right. I think we're saying the same thing. That we're, okay. looking, we're looking at its alignment with the general plan. Yes. And we're doing so through the next two fiscal years. Um, but at some point in the future, we'll look at alignment again um, for years beyond that. Correct. Great. Exactly. And that may be relative to a different general plan at that point. That, that's why I want to be very clear about the scope of what's before us tonight. Just a quick clarification. You're correct. It's only for the fiscal year 22 and 23 capital projects. But as a best practice, staff includes three additional years to include projects that, that might take a little bit longer or and also as a, a, a plan moving forward to see what we have to look out for in the next three years. So, but right now we're only looking at those first two fiscal years. Very good. Well, thank you for confirming that. And um, I guess just as a comment, I want to endorse the comments made by Commissioner McMahon. Um, we're all in favor of more undergrounding, um, especially in that Trevor area. And by Commissioner Link, um, you know, regarding um, the 
seem, seemingly more and more frequent uh, power shutdowns we've been having. Um, I think that, that definitely does merit more examination. That's all I have, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair Norman. Uh, Commissioner Lanson, please. Thank you, Chair Buss, and I guess I'll pick up on a somewhat of a similar theme. Uh, I know the governor just passed some kind of resolution with regard to preparing for the next wildfire. I haven't had a chance to look at it, but I don't know if you guys did and whether or not there's going to be any budgetary issue that will require the city to implement something to implement whatever it is the governor did or to take action as to whatever the governor did. Yeah, I can uh, just quickly uh, respond to the infrastructure component of that. Uh, we're not seeing any uh, um, additional new projects that will come up that uh, we will need to respond to um, or that we will be mandated to do. So I think we're covered in our draft uh, capital so improvement program. The state will not be as part of that program mandating if we do something to assist with regard to fire prevention or minimization of the issue, right? Not in terms of our infrastructure, there will be, you know, for the uh, Southern California Edison and for the fire district and so forth, I believe, but but uh, it doesn't look like anything that directly connects to us. Okay, I, I just want to make sure we're doing everything to protect this mountain behind us as best we can. <laughs> um, and then the last is kind of just the, the foundational issue that I get asked a lot on these kind of things from some people is, you know, we have three priorities. Uh, is it work in that we use all the money towards priority one? And if there's any money, we go to priority two, or how exactly are these projects paid for? What happened was in 2009, City Council came up with three uh, various priorities, priority one, two, and three. Priority one being uh, the most significant or the most uh, time-oriented uh, projects. So the priority ones address health and safety, legal, regulatory requirements. And then in 2015, we added another caveat that if it's a City Council top priority project or project type area. Um, so what happens is initially the project managers, when they go through and request that the pro various projects go onto the wish list, come up with a priority. And usually what we do is during the review process, we do make sure that we look at priority one projects initially first, and then the priority twos are necessary, but not essential. And then priority three projects are the nice to do's. Uh, it would be uh, nice if we have any extra money, which is, is tight right now, but um, and those would be put put off a little bit further. They might be in that year three, four, or five. Um, so that's what we kind of prioritize them. Uh, but yes, usually what we do is we we make sure that those that are priority one have budget to actually move forward within the the next couple of, uh, fiscal years. So if it's a priority three in one fiscal year, it doesn't mean it's going to be moved up to to priority one in the next fiscal year. Every, every uh, two years when we look at the budget, it's reevaluated. So things change. So priorities will uh, differentiate between various um, budget years. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Chair Buss. Thank you. You got it. Thank you, Commissioner Lanson. Um, that was very informative. Uh, I, 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 I am actually out of questions there, but everybody got mine and then some. Um, so all I will follow up with is if you guys need any help deciding where to spend those money and want any of my pet projects, please send me an email. I'll be more than happy to, uh, to give you my list of things that I'd love to see in the city. Uh, but that was a wonderful report. Um, do any of my commissioners have a motion for this? Uh, we actually do have to vote, uh, vote on this. I'll make the motion. I move that we find the proposed capital improvement program for fiscal years 2021 through 2022 and 2022 through 2023 to be consistent with the Thousand Oaks general plan as stated in the resolution and direct staff to convey this finding to city council. Thank you very much, Commissioner McMahon. Uh, will the secretary prepare us for a vote? Commissioner Lanson. Aye. Commissioner Link. Aye. Commissioner McMahon. Aye. Commissioner Newman. Aye. Chair Buss. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you very much. All right, now we'll be moving on to uh, 7A. Um, so we're going to the public hearings. Will the clerk please open the public hearing? 
Item 7A, hearing having been advertised as required by law, is hereby open to consider agenda item 7A, special use permit SUP 2020-70327 to allow a sports training facility with an alternative use of parking facilities within an existing industrial complex located at 2382 Townsgate Road. The applicant is Harkan Enterprises, Inc. Uh, and this is regarding Future Elite Academy. Thank you. Uh, presenting on behalf of staff is senior planner, uh, Lori Young. Lori Young, you're on the floor. Thank you. Yes. Uh, good evening, Chairman Buss and members of the Planning Commission. Uh, if you give me one second with this. This is um, an application for a special use permit at 2382 Townsgate Road. As you can see, this is the, um, the area um, sort of bordered by Townsgate to the north and Hampshire Road to the south. Um, it's in the industrial area of Westlake Village. Uh, the request is to operate a gym in the M1 zone. Um, and they're also, the applicant is also requesting uh, approval of an alternating shared use of parking facilities. Um, and this allows um, projects when there's a parking shortage um, to be able to share parking with the other tenants um, when everybody has different peak times and so they're able to use the parking when other businesses are closed. Um, this use requires a special use permit and planning commission review. Uh, the tenant space is 12,700 square feet. Um, the sports training area is um, on the first floor and about 6,000 square feet um, is the field or the turf area and the weightlifting equipment. Um, gyms and fitness studios, uh, larger, greater than 10,000 square feet in size require uh, planning commission approval in the M1 zone. This SUP is discretionary. Um, this use is not permitted by right. Um, the special use permit uh, process is to ensure that the use will be compatible um, with the nearby uh, land uses. And the Thousand Oaks Municipal Code places the burden of proof on the applicant to de demonstrate um, that the use will be compatible with the surrounding uses. Um, in order to re approve the request, the Planning Commission must make five findings. Uh, project has to be consistent with the general plan. The project needs to comply with all the laws, regulations, and policies, including um, the municipal code. Project will not be detrimental to the public health, safety, or welfare. And project conforms to CEQA. And that the project is compatible with the land uses in the vicinity. Uh, staff cannot support two of the findings. Uh, the first one is the project does not comply with the number of required parking spaces required by the code. And um, we believe that Future Elite Academy is a more intensive business operation um, than the other industrial tenants in the center um, because it involves a lot of large numbers of people, high turnover parking spaces um, at certain peak times. And this uh, could cause conflicts with the other use tenants and is not compatible. Uh, 
Um, this is the aerial view of the site. This um, project here, this is the building. It's a multi-tenant industrial building. Um, it fronts on Townsgate Road and Triumpho Canyon. Uh, there's two driveways that access the site, one on Triumpho Canyon and over here on Townsgate Road. Uh, the applicant's tenant space is over on the east corner of the building, um, right there. Uh, let's see. This is a picture of the site plan. Um, unfortunately, the north arrow is going on the bottom. So you have to turn your head around when you're looking at this. Um, this is Townsgate Road and this is Triumpho Canyon right here. And this is the applicant's tenant space. Uh, right next to it is the Westlake Autoscape business. Next to that is the uh, Shepherd's House Church. Next to the church is Accessory Power. And at the end here is Reliable Floor Covering. The site history, um, this project was approved in 1975 to allow the construction of the 57,000 square foot industrial building. It's a multi-tenant industrial building uh, called, and they call this development Townsgate Center. Um, one thing to note here at this site is that um, three tenants were granted approval of the arch alternating parking program. Uh, one was for booster average sports training facility the other was for Elite Fitness, and the third one was for the Shepherd's House Church, which is still located there. And um, at the time, the Planning Commission thought this was a perfect uh, use because the peak parking, parking demand times were on Sundays when the other uses were closed. In January 2020, um, the, a building permit was issued for tenant improvements. Um, and the plans showed that there was no change in use from existing office um, and storage use. So the plans did not show that they were changing um, the storage to a gym use. Um, the final inspection of the tenant improvements were never performed. Um, the building permits have all since expired. And so the applicant would be required to resubmit building permit applications and new plans to reflect um, the uses that are in there now. Um, and, and also that this use does require a special use permit to be approved first. Uh, Future Elite Academy focuses on sports training for elite youth athletes. Um, they also train high school, college, and some professional athletes. Um, they claim that the facility is unlike other gyms, uh, like nationwide chains. Um, they say that the memberships are not open to the general public, and they're um, members are restricted to students and professional athletes. Um, they currently have um, a hybrid program for seventh and eighth grade students. Um, the students get a combination of sports training and academics. Currently they have 55 students enrolled in grade seven and eighth and um, eighth grade reclassification. Uh, st students re receive academic instructions at their deep space tutoring academy, which is operated by the applicant at 2475 Townsgate Road. Um, 
the Alpine states in there, they provided a training an operational schedule. Um, and in that, uh, it states that during the daytime, between 8 and 2.30 uh, during school hours, only academy students will be uh, working out Monday through Friday. Uh, these students are divided into two groups. One group, the first group starts their day at the gym um, with their training. And the other group starts at uh, the other facility on Townsgate Road for uh, school academics. Um, there are two training sessions during the school day, um, and they're each two hours long. First one's between 8 to 10 a.m., and the second one is 12 to 2 p.m. At around 11 o'clock, students transition to the other activity, whether it's, you know, going back to uh, schooling or, or to work out. And they're transported to these locations um, by the van that's, um, that the uh, Future Elite Academy operates. In the evenings uh, between 4 to 9 p.m. Monday through Friday is when the private group training starts. And this is open to youth, high school, college students, and other adults. Each class is one hour long um, with a maximum of five athletes and one trainer. Um, and they can have three classes going on simultaneously. So a maximum of 18 uh, people will be on the floor working out, could work out at one time. Uh, the gym is open on Saturdays between 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. for youth group training. Um, these classes are also an hour long and will consist of six athletes and a trainer, a uh, maximum of two classes at the same time. So there would be a total of 14 athletes um, and trainers together at one time. On Sundays, the facility is closed. This is the first level floor plan. Um, as you can see, here's the entrance. Um, it consists of offices. This is the workout area. Um, this is, it's, it's divided up. There's the strength training equipment along here. And then this is the turf right here. Um, they have a little lounge area right here and a little kitchen. Um, there was some discussion about how the applicant was trying to submit correct plans, but wasn't able to. And at one point in, I think it was around March 22nd, they did submit uh, a brand new SUP and plans, but then told us to disregard that. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Okay, here's a, a photo that <clears throat> came from, um, I think it was Instagram, and it shows what, what it looks like. Here's the workout weightlifting equipment, and then here's the turf area. This is the second floor level, um, and it just consists of basically offices up here. Here's a conference room, um, and it's open below. The site has a total um, of 113 parking spaces. This parking is non-exclusive and is shared amongst all the tenants. Um, there's three industrial tenants and a church. Um, the project was originally developed for an industrial building and um, really basically parking was required at one per 500, so generally. And then there's um, additional parking for office use and then warehouse use requires a lot less parking. Uh, one space per 1,000 square feet for the first 5,000 square foot of warehousing, and then one 
per each 5,000 square feet after that. Uh, the church is the only non-industrial use and it was granted an alternate, alternate or shared parking facilities um, program um, and because it was the perfect use because it, its peak parking time was um, on Sundays when the other businesses were closed and they have a very um, skeletal staff during the daytime. Parkings for gyms are based on um, a total of the mix of floor area uses. Um, in this case, one space per 200 square feet for the turf area and the weightlifting equipment room. And then one per 200 for all the other additional area. Um, like if you had aerobics, that would be, uh, you would have to, uh, parking would be a lot more, it'd be one per 45 square feet. Um, based on the code, this operation would generate um, a requirement of 55 parking spaces. Um, when looking at the other tenants and adding up their parking requirements, including the parking program that was uh, approved for the church, we come up with 73 spaces. Uh, for a total of 128 spaces and therefore uh, coming up with a 15 space parking de uh, deficit. Uh, these shared parking facilities programs have been approved if it can de be demonstrated uh, by the applicant that uh, the actual demand by other uses um, won't create any conflicts. Um, when, when all the tenants are added up and when their peak parking demand times are uh, evaluated. Um, the applicant provided a parking analysis um, submitted by Walker Consultants and they concluded that the peak parking demand for the applicant would not conflict with the other tenants parking needs and that the uh, 113 spaces would be sufficient to accommodate everyone's needs. Um, there was a couple of, you know, problems here because one, during this COVID time, uh, you're not really able to identify actual parking demand uh, because many of the people were working from home and not a lot of people weren't, you know, frequently in the center. Um, this the parking demand for the gym relied on the operational uh, training program and description provided by the applicant. Um, it went into detail about what types of activities, what classes were gonna be offered, how many employees, how many athletes, what hours were these classes, um, how would the athletes get to the um, building uh, what we noticed was that this description was not consistent with the activities and classes um, that we saw on the applicant's website and social media. Um, it appears that this gym is involved in a lot more intensive uses than uh, what was or what is presented in the training schedule. Um, a couple of other things. Uh, you know, whether it's gonna make a big difference or not, um, but looking at the whole parking evaluation together, you know, there might not be a complete understanding of what's going on. Um, for one thing, Autoscape, uh, the next door neighbor to Future Elite Academy, um, I guess they started a social club and also have uh, some uh, special events on Saturdays when they bring out the cars um, and people walk around. So that was not considered as part of the analysis. And um, it was discussed that at four o'clock is the peak parking time for Future Elite Academy um, when the other businesses are winding down. So they may be winding down, but they have not yet closed. So there could be some, some a few conflicts there. In order to make 
uh, or have the alternative sh and shared parking facilities program work, um, the applicant would have to adhere to the strict training schedule that they put into the, um, the scope of work. Um, and this is where staff does not feel that we don't have a lot of confidence that they could follow the schedule as written when there have been difficulty following other city requirements. And this includes, you know, starting work without building permits, um, submitting plans did not, that did not reflect the gym use, um, continuing to operate without a special use permit, even though they were advised that they need to stop all operations and opening a school knowing it is prohibited in the M1 zone, which they were advised several times. Staff therefore cannot endorse the alternating parking program request and parking deficit. Um, it's felt that FEA is an intense use with various activities throughout the day and evening and it's something not compatible with the other industrial uses in the center. Um, we feel that the proposed use will negatively, negatively impact the utility and value of property in the M1 zone, um, constrain the parking resources intended for those industrial users. And with the emphasis on the young elite athletes, this may deter other industrial uses from locating here. Uh, one example was the Leaf Cannabis Dispensary uh, project, which was denied by the council because of concerns of uh, having the young people uh, from Future Elite Academy next door to this type of use. And so the the this use we don't feel is compatible with the other uses. Um, we have, there's a reason why we don't have residential uses, schools, assisted living uh, facilities. Um, they're all classified as sensitive land uses and are not permitted in the industrial zone. This was a, a photo taken um, by one of our co-compliance officers of the interior. And this is from their website, which states uh, they have California state accredited teachers. This is something else that was pulled off uh, their website. Um, and see, they're currently in session for the 2020-2021 academic year. Um, and that there's a demand for high school already. Um, and at higher grade level expansion is on the horizon. So this leads us to think that they're uh, gonna be expanding the business. Here's something else that came from the website. Um, who will be training? They have monthly memberships that they're offering um, and that fitness is for everybody. It seems like not just athletes, but for anybody who wants to work out and these times are throughout the day and um, Monday through Friday. And it was also advertised that there was yoga gonna be offered on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, this is something that uh, we saw on I think Instagram. Um, it shows the music studio. I guess this will be part of uh, coursework offered to the academy students, students, but they're all also um, offering rental time for anybody else who wants uh, record to do recordings or lessons. Um, this was not included in in the operational schedule that they provided to us, and this is the latest thing that we saw. Um, I mean, is this a new use? This looks like a hair salon or barbershop uh, service that they will be providing, um, which is also not part of the training schedule. In conclusion, um, 
we feel that Future Lead Academy is a beneficial program and is an asset to the community. Um, there's nothing like it um, that exists now, um, but we don't feel it's compatible at this particular site. Um, the project does not comply with the Thousand Oaks uh, parking requirements, and we feel that there could be um, future conflicts with the other tenants. Um, the gym provides a more expansive scope of work than found in the training schedule that they provided. Um, and with the school, um, it just seems like a more intense activity. Um, the use is more like a commercial operation, um, which would not be compatible with the other industrial uses. Um, so therefore, the recommendation um, is to deny SUP 2020-70327 based on the findings that are contained in the resolution. Um, however, if uh, the Planning Commission decides to approve the SUP, um, it needs to do the following things. It needs to provide uh, findings of approval, those five um, findings. It needs to state that the project satisfies CEQA and um, staff will bring back um, the project to the Planning Commission uh, after it's been reviewed with the applicant. Uh, that concludes my remarks. Um, there's another thing I wanted to add is that in the staff report, table four uh, was referred to, but it was really incorporated, the information was incorporated into other tables. So that's why it's not shown. So that was an error. Um, and there are other people here tonight also, um, Steve Kearns, planning manager, uh, Jeff Ware, building division services um, director, and uh, Brian Sells, who's the senior co-compliance inspector, and also Ann uh, Guevara, also a co-compliance inspector. Um, that concludes my remarks and uh, available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Senior Planner, Lori Young. Uh, my fellow commissioners, any questions? I see uh, Mr. Newman, he's got his hand up here. You have the floor, Vice Chair Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Ms. Young, very much for your presentation. I wanna begin with a scoping question uh, that perhaps is for Mr. Heger. Um, Less than half an hour before we began our sound checks this evening, we received a different set of plans than those that were included with public notice that, with the agenda that came out last week. And my question is, what is before us this evening? Which, which set of plans should we be using in our assessment of this application? That's a great question, Mr. Newman. Uh, let me just state that uh, staff's presentation from Ms. Young is based on the plans that she received uh, weeks, if not months ago. So to your point, if there are new plans that are being considered by the applicant, that the applicant is adamant must be the ones that are going to be reviewed, we would need to have that discussion. From right now, I'm not positive that that is the case. Um, if you, as you heard Ms. Young earlier, she made a comment that there were some a new SGP and some plans that were submitted in the end of March of this year. And then once we made an inquiry as to the purpose of those plans, we were informed that it was a mistake and to be just move forward with the hearing as, as scheduled right now. And so based upon that, I think we need a little bit more understanding from the applicant because whatever your position is, whether it's going to be to deny or to approve, you certainly need to be doing it based on the set of plans that they, being the applicant, are seriously considering as, as their plan. I mean, that's what we're, we have to present for you. Uh, but at this time, I think we, unless it changes with applicant given information, uh, we need to see where, where they are. And, and if that is the case where they have a new set of plans that they are submitting, that they want the planning commission to consider, we can take that up once we understand that position. So do I understand correctly then? And thank you for that. Do I understand correctly that 
our alternatives are either A, to approve or reject the application, including the plans previously received. That's, that's option A or B. And we'll, we'll ask this of the applicant um, when it's their turn. But B, if they say, no, 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 the, the, this set of plans that just came in, this is the correct set of plans. Um, one option there, uh, option B, let's call it, would be to have a, uh, a continuance to a, a later date to consider that other set of plans. That would be correct, uh, generally correct. I, I think it's important to note that, again, we are basing the presentation, Mr. Young's position is based on the plans that she reviewed over a period of time. So again, to your point, our position is as laid out by Ms. Young and maybe Mr. Kearns might have something to add. Um, but as you pointed out, if it turns out that they were they want a different set of plans that they really need because that might affect the conditions as well if you were to approve it, then we would need to probably continue it or have that discussion with them. Okay, that seems like a pretty important question to me in that, um, as I said, we just received the plans prior to the meeting. Um, I frankly have not reviewed them. Um, I have reviewed the other plans in detail, um, but but I'm glad that, that you've cleared up what is and isn't before us for a decision tonight. Excuse me. Yes. Um, I'd just like to say that staff worked many iterations of the floor plans over and over to fine tune it, to get it to what you see tonight and to make sure it was consistent with what they were telling us. Um, and so, yeah, just wanted to mention that. I, I appreciate that. And that's that's one reason I'm asking what what is before us tonight. And that the answer to that is Mr. Here just underlined, is the set of plans that you worked and you and, and your colleagues have been working on um, for some time. It's not the plans we received two, two microseconds before the meeting began. Right, and, and like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, they did submit the SUP and these plans that look similar to these plans that you received. Um, and we were told, don't disregard it. It was a mistake, it was an error. Don't look at it. Thanks. I, I mean, and, and I, I think that has to be a factor as well in considering the application. But, but again, I just want to underscore the application before us this evening is the set of plans that was received some time ago and that staff has had a chance to thoroughly examine, correct? correct. That's correct, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Newman. That's a really good point. The staff report, the analysis that was provided to you was based on a set of plans that we, um, are attached to your packet. The set of plans that were submitted tonight, staff has not had a chance to perform any analyses and the parking and operational standards could be different and could result in different metrics that would be evaluated. So okay. I'm, just, I'm, I'm very excited to hear that <laughs> the set of plans that I have not had a chance to review are not in scope. So thank you. Thank you for clearing that up. Um, with regard to Ms. Young's presentation and, and an area that is in scope, um, you've indicated that there is training and I'm, I'm sure the difference between tutoring and, and a, a tutoring center in the school may come up later in the hearing. But um, with regard to whatever business activity FDA is in, engaged in, in an M1 zoned area, um, my question is, is the city aware of other tutoring facilities, not schools, but tutoring facilities such as SAT prep that are in N1 zone areas elsewhere in the city? Um, I believe there's another one, um, but they're more of a like one-on-one, -on -one, you know, it's a small thing. It's not like um, students are enrolled there every day through an entire academic school year. So how does that work? It's essentially an office in an industrial zone? Um, I believe so. I think Mr. Um, Kearns might have an answer to that. Yeah, most most of our tutoring centers are located in commercial zones. Um, we have had a few in the past that did occupy industrial areas um, and operate there. They are considered 
in our code as a as a training facility. So training facilities are allowed the M1 zone, um, and that's how they've they've gotten in there. Uh, the intensity is one thing we do have to take a look at. It's that's really a, an interpretation of our code as to how they qualify and how they fit into our code because you have to look at uses because it's not one size fits all by any means. So you look at the code, look at the uses that are listed and interpret it to see if it fits that, that use. That's a good segue to the next question. Um, are there other tutoring facilities that hold uh, classes for many hours per day uh, each day in, we did, in M1 zoned areas? We did reach out to many of the tutoring centers. Um, a lot of them are not available because of the COVID uh, you know, order and they're just not operating like they normally would. Mm -hmm. uh, we stopped by a Sullivan Learning Center and um, they're limited on their hours. So they they have, you know, they do have multiple kids at one time, but they're limited on how long they, op they operate. Is that a function of COVID restrictions or uh, their permit to operate? They, uh, they mentioned it was just how they operate. They'll take who they can and, and uh, hold, a, hold a class, if you will. Okay, so, so a tutoring center that operates five, six, seven, eight hours per day in an M1 zoned area would be very unusual or non-existent otherwise. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, that would be atypical for sure. Okay, great. Um, Ms. Young, I did also have a question about uh, moving on to parking. Okay, wait. I'm sorry, did you did you have a follow-on comment on the on the uh, zoning? Yes, I just want to say that when I first talked to the applicant, um, when they were going over what kinds of activities they were doing, one of a one activity or one part of the program was uh, offering a school for seventh and eighth graders um, within this building, and I had told them that you know. It's not permitted with the M in the M1 zone. And then later on, when they submitted their application, they said, oh, we found another building. We're going to sign the lease. And I said, well, where is it? And that was also M1. And I said, you know, you need to check with me before. And then we found out that they have a tutoring center. Okay, and, and, and on that, I mean, before we move on to parking then, you mentioned several instances where there was, I, I wanna pick a neutral word here, let's say a disconnect um, between the initial representation of an activity and the later discovery of actual activity. And um, my question on that is, how was the city discovering these disconnects? Like there, there's language in, in the staff report saying things like um, it was discovered that um, the applicant was engaged in this activity. Um, how was that discovery made? Um, many of those instances occurred, I believe, through when code compliance was out doing their COVID checks. Um, and, you know, maybe they'd like to speak on that issue. Um, the other thing is we saw, well, I've heard from other tenants um, about what was going on. Um, they informed me that they were concerned. And then also, you know, on the news and then on the website, yeah, and of course the website is public or, or an Instagram feed is public. And um, I believe you showed, um, is it the case? Well, let me ask it as a question. Is it the case that you showed uh, pages from the website and or from the Instagram feed that were at variance with what was represented as the business activity in the application? Um, yes, well, they were not supposed to be operating at all, for one thing. And then two, it just doesn't match what they're saying in the operational schedule. If I may, Chair Buss and, and Mr. Newman, um, you may remember there was a, a very brief statement about leaf dispensary, uh, have an application for a location next door to this location. 
Yes. And during that, that presentation, there was a time period where um, the applicants for this uh, project tonight uh, mentioned that they had a gym use and that they thought that they had followed the city process in 2019. And that wasn't looked into. And the application that we received was for a warehouse with some minor changes to, uh, to the interior of the warehouse. And so that's initially how it was presented to the city from the document itself. Once we learned more about the gym use and this this new program that they were going wanted to process, um, that's when more attention was given to what do you what are you actually proposing here exactly? And then based upon that, it was and they were informed that they needed to go through an SVP process or a spe uh, special use permit process. Thanks for that. And then following up on the permitting question. Uh, one of our the attachments to the staff report is a chronology of events, different steps in the permitting process. And I just want to be sure I understand clearly from the city's perspective what, what happened with signatures on permits. Um, I think if I'm reading attachment six correctly, there was an episode where the city received what was represented to be a signed permit and the city's building inspector said, we haven't signed that. Do I understand that correctly? Yes, I could. If, could if you may, uh, Mr. Kearns or, or I, if I would just jump on here. So as you look at attachment six, there's a history of information that we provided to you regarding um, various instances that we had. So one of those is that when you have a, a the building permit was initially pulled but that requires then other permits to be pulled, such as the electrical permit and a, um, a plumbing permit, for example. Those were actually requested initially, but not pulled. So as time went on, no, no inspections were being done, no permits were pulled for the electrical or for the plumbing. Uh, but then what happens is we received a request to sign off on the permit and we the city received a document that had a signature for signing off by a building inspector of some that's where the signature was located. We took that in and the city's position is that based on our review of the document, not one building inspector for the city signed off on any document like that. Not only that, but there was no pulling of the plumbing and electrical permits. So those would never have been finalized either because they were never pulled those permits. And the final thing is there, were doc there was information on that document for, for example, a mechanical permit which was never even pulled by the applicant in the first place. So that was signed off on. So the city's position is not, is I want to be very clear about this. The city's position is that no city inspector, no building inspector for the city signed off on that document. They do not recognize the signature. So at that point, what was decided was that we would hold off on any further building inspection permits until they follow the process of getting an SUP. And if you were to approve this project, the conditions include a requirement that this applicant needs to get those permits pulled, processed correctly, and, and the inspections be done correctly. Okay, but up to this point, right now today, April 12, the city has not signed off on building permits, and it sounds like there's some permits that haven't been pulled, let alone signed off. Is that correct? That is correct. All right, thank you. The um, final question I have is on the parking. I just want to be sure I understand. Uh, this is table two in the staff report. Um, parking is based on uh, floor area in part. And table two shows that the square footage for the front entryway in the building plan would require two parking spaces. And my question on that is why would a front entryway require any parking spaces at all? Um, well, this, um, that's just how the code, you know, measures things. And mm -hmm. when you, do, um, we look at gross floor area, um, and that's where a parking study or parking analysis could look at and say, well, certain areas don't generate, won't generate parking and those people are already there. Um, Okay, but, but it, for purposes of code compliance, the city's required to allocate a set number of parking spaces per um, 
a set amount of square footage, um, depending on what, and, and the ratio of those may differ, I understand, based on zoning, but, but or, or land use type, but it, there is a requirement to allocate a set ratio of parking spaces to floor space, is that correct? That's correct. It, it, it could be like a grocery store where um, you have people in the front, but less people in the back, but we still count the whole, um, you know, gross floor area. Right. Okay. So it's not, it's not like the city saying, well, we think there's going to be 15 people stuffed in the front hall. That, that's not the case. Um, right. but, but there is square footage and it is required that, that any square footage should have some ratio that's not zero. Uh, to parking spaces. Right, and and that's where the um, parking analysis comes in is because they can look at things and say, well, you know, it's really not gonna require that many spaces because of this and this and that. Okay, and then one last question on that. Um, it sounds from your report and it, you pointed to um, several pieces of marketing collateral website, Instagram, from the applicant in support of this, that a concern of, that a concern of the cities is that the activities currently described may grow in, in, in nature, in scope, um, may involve more activity, more people, more of a demand for parking than are currently envisioned. Is that a fair statement? Yes, that's correct. All right, that's all I have. Thanks very much. If I could uh, just add uh, to that, the two main concerns in front of you tonight from, from planning perspective are the compatibility issue with the other tenants in the center, as well as the parking supply versus the actual parking demand. So those are the two concerns we made um, in the findings, and that was in the staff report as well. And I, I probably should follow up on that just, just to be clear on, on what you're um, referring to there, Mr. Kearns. Um, when we as planning commissioners grant a special use permit, there are five tests that we apply. Um, and three of them are not in question, um, but two of them are. Um, one is compatibility with surrounding uses and one is uh, parking. Is that is that a fair statement? That is a fair statement, yeah. All right, thanks very much. That's all. Thank you, Vice Chair Newman. Uh, to any of my other fellow commissioners, I see Commissioner McMahon's hand up. Yes, yeah. uh, thank you. Um, I did have a question about Autoscape. Um, what type of business is that? Uh, that's vehicle storage. Okay, okay, and um, and you mentioned that they were doing, you had two comments that they were doing some extra social events that hadn't been noted before. And then you also said that they weren't in the parking study. What was it, the whole business wasn't put in the parking study or was it just these extra social things that were not in the study? No, they were included in the parking study um, as one of the industrial uses. Um, what wasn't included were, and I, I found out by calling them, you know, I saw something on a website um, where they mentioned about having this social club, um, which are really for members um, that had their cars parked there and just a place for they, they can hang out. Um, and then also on Saturdays, they were um, having like infrequent uh, events where they take all the cars out from the building and park them in the parking lot um, and have coffee and walk around and talk to each other. Um, mm -hmm. uh, those things were not, uh, whether or not they would um, create a big impact, we don't know, but it's just one, another part of the whole picture that um, we feel is a little bit unknown. Okay, and was the parking study done by an outside consultant? Uh, yes, it was. Are they here today? Yes. Okay, so I can ask the follow-up question to them. Um, I guess my last question is, did you have any 
comments from the other tenants um, with regard to how they feel about this uh, potential new tenant um, and how it would impact them or if it would impact them? Um, yes, I did. In the beginning, when I was first working with them, I had several calls from tenants um, who were concerned about the parking and that uh, Future Elite was taking up too many parking spaces. Um, I haven't heard any comments lately. Um, I know the applicant's been, uh, they probably had people parking along the street and uh, they have the van to bring the kids over um, and they're probably parking a lot over on the other side. Um, staff did ask about, you know, we, we wanted to study of what's happening at the school site, you know, because we don't want to create a parking problem at that site either. Um, <clears throat> but I was told that uh, they only need six parking spaces there because the whole building is empty except for them. But, you know, that's just a temporary situation, so. Okay, um, thank you. And I guess my, my next question is for the parking consultant. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner McMahon. Uh, Commissioner Ling, please, you have the floor. Commissioner Link, you are muted, sir. Of course, you have to do it at least once per meeting, right? <laughs> uh, so for my own edification uh, and being that I work elsewhere uh, and, and not familiar with all the zoning, but uh, and, and for the viewers as well, what constitutes the M1 zone aside from industrial park? I mean, what, what uses are allowed as a result of, of that zoning or in that zoning? Well, there's like, um warehousing, packaging, manufacturing. Um, these uses for like an M1 zone, you know, all of the, any kind of like harmful stuff, you're supposed to all keep it within the building. So generally not a use that would contemplate any kind of gathering that is uh, sensitive, like uh, medical facilities or schools potentially. Right. Um, hospitals are not permitted in, you know, in a industrial area. I mean, in our city, we have them, you know, that's also a, a PL zone. Um, playgrounds, you know, I mean, a lot of cities just uh, don't allow sensitive uses in an industrial area. But there are, there are cases where it's okay um, when you know, it's demonstrated that there won't be any problems that, you know. And that would arise out of a special use permit. Correct. Okay. Uh, and then my, I have quite a few questions for the parking consultant, but uh, uh, how many iterations of the report, the parking report were created? Um, about four. Okay. Met what happens is, is that um, one part of the puzzle would change. And then that would involve changing the other uh, items to be consistent. You know, so there was the floor plans and there was the parking study, and then there was their um, scheduling. So it was a case of when you change one, everything else changed along with it. So the project description was essentially fluid. Yes. Okay. Uh, was the methodology with which the shared parking analysis uh, conducted discussed prior to being implemented by the consultant? Well, the city told them that the only way you would be able to go in since by code there was a deficit was through this uh, providing the alternative parking analysis. Um, you know, unfortunately at the time we had, co we have COVID and so we can't get, you know, a true actual, you know, demand count for that. So, you know, we did the best we could with what was going on. Understood. And uh, thank you for the presentation. 
Thank you, Commissioner Link. Uh, Commissioner Lanson, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Buss. I only have a few questions since my commissioners did such a good job getting all the ones I had ready to ask out of the way. Um, uh, Ms. Young, the only follow-up I had is, again, kind of what Commissioner Newman was focusing on. I know we were looking at pictures from Instagram and other social medias. Did, did somebody, it sounds like somebody from the city staff went into the facility to see something. Is that correct? Right. Code compliance went and inspected the, uh, the two sites uh, several times, and that's where they got the, uh, the photos from. And the code compliance, who would have that been just to? Oh, uh, Byron Sells, uh, Ann Guevara, and I believe uh, Jeff Ware. I'm not sure if he actually went there. Well, he's on the line. Maybe he can. Commissioner share. Lanson, if I may. Yes. Um, so, yes, there, there were many situations in which staff went out there, whether to, based on complaints that we received, to see if there was operation happening again because they don't have a permit to operate at this time. So it was to even establish that there was operations even going on. And then with COVID, there were concerns and complaints received regarding a gym being operated during COVID. And so again, staff, again, uh, how the county worked with health orders would be that st uh, city staff, for example, the thousand notes would actually uh, be the initial investigator for the county and then report to the county and then have the county um, review it and make decisions on issuing orders. So that was done. And I will tell you that in this case, issue uh, orders were issued to stop uh, operating uh, due to COVID concerns. So those two things have happened. So there were observations made by staff. And as Ms. Young uh, stated, um, we do have co-compliance officers if, if needed to discuss, again, basic observations that they made during their times out there. My, my only question is, is whoever saw the facility, did it basically the pictures that Ms. Young had in her presentation, were those accurate depictions of what they saw? So if, if somebody from staff um, from the co-compliance actually took those photos, I, I'm not sure if, if they actually took those photos or not, but if they did, they can certainly attest to that. And I think they're on the line right now. I believe Ann Guevara should be the appropriate person to answer that. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I did conduct several um, visits to the facility. Most of just, just were follow-ups from the complaints that we received from the citizens that uh, Jim was operating. Out of the visits that I did, um, I did go inside, witness um, adults working out inside and a lot of my exterior observations were of youth being dropped off between the school and the gym and also working out inside um, the gym portion. So um, again, in terms of, I don't know if you saw Ms. Young's photographs, which again, I think uh, Mr. Heger were, were taken from Instagram and other things. I don't think the staff took the pictures. Um, I don't know if you saw those pictures, but I'm just trying to see, does that basically basically represent what you saw? Yes, uh, the picture with the students in the classroom, that was one of the times that we did go out to the school. So that was a photo that um, my partner, uh, Byron Sells, took that day. And then the other photos, I believe, were photos taken from their social media, such as Instagram or um, Facebook. OK, great. Thank you. That's all the questions I had. Thank you, Commissioner Lanson. All right, everybody asked a lot of good questions, so let me see what I got here. Um, I want to follow up on um, Commissioner Link's question about M1 scope. Uh, we talked uh, a lot about industrial warehousing uses. Uh, my question is, uh, do churches, social clubs, and batting cages fall into that M1 designation? Because all three of those things either currently exist or have existed at that address. It's... Um we look at it on a case-by-case -case basis through an SUP. Okay. But, uh, okay. but the reason I'm asking is because literally a church is two doors down, and you're saying that the auto place that stores cars next door is actually also being used as a social club. Right. Well, 
We don't so know. I'm just trying to understand because because we're talking about parking analysis and whether or not these people are using more parking than we anticipated. I'm curious if the other approved uses that may not necessarily be industrial are currently using more parking than may, maybe was anticipated when they were approved. The um, the business operator of Westlake Autoscape told me that he has an agreement um, with the <clears throat> excuse me church and also with UCLA at their facility to use their parking lot maybe on Saturdays. Okay. Okay, so that's good to know. All right. Um, okay, then um, the other question I've got is, is the tutoring center um, that's not located on site, correct, if I'm understanding this correctly, that tutoring center is at a separate location where the kids are being shuttled back and forth. Is that at an M1 site? Because I hear a lot of people asking about this uh, facility and about children being learning at a tutoring facility at an M1 location. But I don't think that they're learning or that the tutoring center that these people are operating is at the M1 site, correct? Or is it at another location that is an M1 site? It is um, located across the street and toward the east a little bit. Um, okay, I'm at 2555 Townsgate right now. So where are they at? Uh, Commissioner Bess, if you're familiar with Yoga Works, they're occupying that space where um, Yoga Works used to exist. Oh, okay, yes, perfect. Yeah. yeah um, Full disclosure to everybody watching, I uh, my office is on Townsgate Road, not very far from the site. So, and I'm currently sitting there. You can see my blinds. Um, so uh, let me go on. So then, um, is the site that's off location? Is that one that's been approved by the city and they're in compliance over there? or is there an issue with this business in its entirety operating with the city? Because my understanding is, is right now we're, the city's telling me that they are currently operating a business out of compliance at this location, but do they, is the, the location they're operating at where their tutoring center exists, is that in compliance with the city and, well, and an existing business that's recognized? The tutoring center, um, is called Deep Space Tutoring Academy. Okay, so it's a separate LLC and everything, right? Well, we have not, I have not found Deep Space, that name anywhere, um, anywhere at all. And um, when they came in to get their uh, business license, they put Deep Space, you know, Tutoring Academy. Okay. Um, probably wouldn't trigger us, you know, looking out for future elite academy. Gotcha. So, Commissioner Buss, if, if I can clarify, um, a tutoring center in itself has been interpreted via our code to be allowed wherever training is allowed, training facilities are allowed. Okay. This uh, originally when future elite came in, they had a classroom use, so a school use within their existing tenant space. We advised them at that, that point that they could not have a school in the M1 zone. Uh, subsequently, they got a business license at the Yoga Works location for a tutoring center. Um, Copy that. that. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I appreciate that clarification. That's 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 what I was trying to understand. I was trying to wrap my head around how they've got two different facilities, two different businesses. <clears throat> so, um, I, I I do also want to make sure I understand this business currently exists and is currently in operation, despite the fact that we're discussing whether or not they should allow it, be allowed to be in operation. That's correct, right? Yes. And this business also was responsible for the denial of another business next door that was reviewed by the city council is what you're telling me. Yes. If I made sure, Buzz, I, I would just say that they certainly uh, came to the meeting in, uh, to express concern and opposition to the leap dispensary application. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, at yeah, the end yeah, of the day, yeah, it was yeah. uh, city council made a decision at that night to uh, deny leaf dispensaries. So we may or may not, they may not have any re any responsibility for that, but they were there as an existing business and a representative of the business community here saying that they did not want that business present, despite the fact that they were operating currently without city permission, essentially, right? Well, as, as stated earlier, when I brought up the leaf dispensary issue, it was because during that opposition that they expressed, they mentioned that they were going to operate this gym and training facility and this unique type of business that they were 
presenting to this. And that's how we got into, wait a second, what are you actually doing at this location and where are you proposing? And that's how we started this whole process with SUP application. Got it, okay, that makes sense. Um, I had a, a question just for clarification and I think I already know the answer, but um, there is street parking on Townsgate, correct? Uh, between um, Bowdoin Camp and Westlake Boulevard. Correct on that? Yes, there is. Okay, I see some ads nodding. Okay, that's a confirmation, yes. Um, I believe that's all of my questions for you guys. I am looking forward to the presentation from the applicant. Um, so, Mr. Uh, Chair? Yes. Oh, yes, uh, Commissioner Newman, I'm sorry. Vice Chair Newman, please, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a couple of quick follow-ups on questions from yourself and Commissioner Lanson. Uh, Commissioner Lanson um, asked about on-site inspections by city staff. And my question on that is, is that a normal activity either for code compliance or planning staff um, when, when there's some question about activity at a site? Well, just I, Lori, I'll, I'll take this one, please. Um, there was an active building permit that was still be going through the inspection process for the first permit that they pulled, which was for the um, for bathroom remodel and some storage use and stuff like that. If I could add into here, this is uh, Jeff Ware, Building Services Division Manager. Uh, there were actually no building inspections conducted at this property on the existing issued building permit the inspections that were being conducted were twofold. Uh, initially, it was because we received complaints that building improvements were being conducted without a permit. That was the initial one that eventually uh, resulted in the issuance of a stop work order while the permit process was moving forward. The, the second issues that were there, uh, code compliance was there for, were primarily in response to COVID compliance on behalf of the county. Uh, the code compliance officers of this city and many other cities acted as ambassadors for the County of Ventura in its efforts for COVID compliance. And many of the following subsequent inspections were related to that particular activity. Okay, I, I was actually asking a slightly different question, which is whether it's customary for city staff, either code compliance or planning staff to go on site to a location. In, in the case of code compliance, it's customary, isn't it, for city staff to, to go on site if, if there are complaints received? Correct. Okay, and then same question for planning staff. Um, if an application is under review, is it customary for city staff, maybe not 100% of cases, but in some or many cases, to go on site to inspect a site? Yes. Absolutely. It's, it's part of the review process. Okay. So it's the only difference is in this case, they're already operating. And yeah. that leads me to the other question I wanted to ask, um, which is follows on Chair Buss's question. Does the applicant hold any permit for the business that is currently operating from the city? Any permit from the city? for the currently operating business? No. no, they do not. Okay, that's all I had, thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Newman. Um, so now we will be moving on um, to the applicant's uh, representative to speak. Uh, you have 15 minutes to speak. Uh, please state your name and city of residence for the record. I believe that uh, representing the applicant will be uh, Mark Sellers. Mark Sellers, you have the floor, sir. And if you can unmute yourself. Unmute. All right, you are unmuted, sir. The floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you. I'm <laughs> there's been a, a good deal of discussion tonight uh, about whether the applicant is operating. Uh, I don't believe they're operating in this term of a commercial opportunity. Uh, a while ago, uh, the applicant signed a five-year lease, went in to get tenant improvements to the city planning and building safety counter. Uh, they were approved, they were permits were issued, and then the 
asked, were any other permits needed for what I want to do, the sports training facility? And he was told the counter person, no. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people take what counter people say as gospel, but it's, and he thinking that he had all the permits needed to open and operate sports training facility. Uh, then he found out that the neighbor was going to be a cannabis uh, dispensing off use, would never sign up for his sports academy once the tenant improvements were finished, but they weren't at the time, he wasn't operating. Uh, so he basically I believe that we have lost Mr. Sellers. Um, uh, is there another uh, representative for the applicant available? Yeah. Well, I think I'm back. But I don't oh. know. This is. Yeah, Mr. Sellers. Um, yeah, we, we don't have a good connection with you, sir. I'm here. Can you see me? I can hear you, but I cannot see you. Mr. Sellers, if you could turn off your video, it might help with the audio. Thank you so much, Michelle. What? I don't know if we're going to get Mr. Sellers back right. here. Uh, so we, we fought that. We went to the city council, and the city council basically said, Hello? Mr. Sellers, you 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 are you are you keep cutting out, sir. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. And now we can't. <laughs> All right, we are going All to right. have to uh, re-advise. We went uh, to the city council. The city. Mr. Sellers, Mr. Sellers, council can you hold up for a minute? Mr. Sellers, can you hear me? At this point, uh, does anybody have a contact phone over for Mr. Sellers? I think that we should recess for 10 minutes, see if we can establish a connection with Mr. Sellers that's useful, and, uh, and right. then continue the meeting if that's okay with everybody. Please. All right, let's do that. Uh, we're going to go ahead and recess for 10 minutes. Uh, we will be back at 8.17. In the meantime, we'll try to figure out if we can get Mr. Sellers back on. Thank you. This is Michelle. I will give Mr. Sellers a call and give him the call and information. You got it. Thank you so much, Michelle. And I'll see everybody back here in 10 minutes.
Okay, I think we're back. All right, I believe that we also have our presenter. Uh, so just uh, to bring everybody back to speed, we are on agenda item 7A. Uh, we are now going to hear from the applicant and their applicant representative, which is Mark Sellers. And I believe we have a good connection with Mr. Sellers now. So Mr. Sellers, you may begin again because uh, we did not get much of the beginning of your presentation. One thing, Chair Buss, is to make sure Commissioner McMahon is back. Oh, shoot. We are going to hold up for a minute and make sure that Commissioner McMahon returns. <laughs> Thank you very much, Commissioner Lanson, for noticing that. I'd like to thank TOTV for not forcing me to look pensive. All right, looks like we have everybody back now. So uh, we are going to uh, return the floor to uh, the presentation of the applicant on item 7A. Um, that will be Mark Sellers. And Mark Sellers, you have the floor, sir. Yes. Hi, I hope everybody can hear me now. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I was just pointing out that the applicant has never operated one of these facilities before. The applicant is new in this kind of use. The applicant uh, went down in the building and safety. Actually, first the applicant signed a five-year lease, went down to building and safety and said, uh, I want to do some tenant improvements. Uh, he got those tenant improvement permits for those tenant improvements approved. And he asked, is there any other permit that I need to operate this training facility? He was told over the counter, no, there wasn't, that's it. He probably shouldn't have relied on the representation from somebody in building and safety over the counter, but he did and went back and started on the tenant improvements. And then they suddenly discovered that the property next door was going to be a cannabis dispensary. Uh, he wanting to get young uh, kids in his facility, wanting to make sure parents would sign up their kids at Oaks Christian and Westlake High School for his facility, realized that having a cannabis dispensary right next door to his football training facility was uh, going to kill that project. He knew that it was either the cannabis has to move or I'm losing my lease. I don't have a business. We went to the city council. The city council basically said, uh, we want to see something for our kids, and the cannabis business can go find another location. And that was the first time anybody ever mentioned, you need a special use permit. Or we think you need a special use permit. It wasn't even a firm conviction from the planning director. And just for a little bit of history, I represented uh, Billy Miller. Billy Miller was a football star at Westlake High School, went to USC, and uh, was an All-American there, and then went on to the New Orleans Saints. Billy came to me and said, I want to open up a sports training facility in the same industrial zone just down the street. I then called the uh, planning director, John Prescott, sat down with him, and we realized that this was not a gym this is an appointment-only facility that this would only have a limited number of attendees on a daily basis. And uh, Mr. Prescott agreed that we'll just do a deed restriction and just say you can't have more than 30 people at a time. It's got to be appointment-only, and it's not going to be unlimited membership. And that's how Billy Miller opened his facility in the same zone and operated for many years without any problem. So this special use permit for this kind of specialized use was a complete surprise to us. And uh, we think that it's really not a gym uh, because of that focus use. We, however, applied for the special use permit. We hired a uh, walker and consultants to do a shared parking study. And that came back that basically said the peak hour, you need 23 spaces. And we're also at the same time, under the lease with the landlord, we had the right to use 24 spaces. The reason for that being not a real impact is that a lot of parents drop off their young football players who aren't old enough to drive. 
and the client is using stands to get people there which don't need to park. They can drop off their uh, athletes and leave. So the real uh, impacts on that center are minimal. And I can't think of having a better neighbor than a church that's closed almost every day and peak uh, is on Sunday when my client's operations are closed. So it seems to be a situation that works out well. And what I really uh, feel is going to be the control here is the landlord there who manages all the uses, who manages all the parking, is a very tough, smart businessman, and he's represented by tough legal counsel. I've already experienced that. And if the uh, future elite ever causes a problem with parking by uh, impacting the other tenants, that landlord is going to terminate that, that uh, bring an action to terminate that lease. So I think what we have to do is have faith in that this landlord, and I believe he has a, a letter to the Planning Commission, uh, has looked at all these uses and leases and spaces and needs and feel that they all work, uh, as opposed to a lot of speculation by staff that, oh, well, maybe we'll have problems in the future. Um, I just think that... Uh, We've got that as well as I've looked at the conditions of approval that are in your packet tonight. Uh, the uh, applicant has, and we find those acceptable. And those conditions of approval limit the operation time and uh, classes and uh, basically the scope of the operation to that that was set forth in the parking study. And we're willing to accept those and go on with that and uh, just basically try to get something that's uh, good for the kids. This has been an awful time for businesses. I have a lot of tenants that have gone out of business, and uh, it's something that I think the city ought to be trying to encourage and help uh, this applicant and uh, provide a little flexibility here uh, rather than some of these rigid numbers I hear from staff. And with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Brett Harrison uh, or the parking consultant, which I think is Jeff Wittstein, and uh, let them make the presentation unless there's any questions. Uh, no, you've got 15 minutes to present, so please continue. We'll ask our questions at the end. Okay. Uh, well, uh, then, uh, is Brett there? <laughs> I am. All right. Hi, everybody. Go ahead. Um, thank you so much for uh, allowing us an opportunity to speak. It's been a long time coming. Um, I want to thank uh, Lori Young specifically uh, for the last 15 months of uh, all the back and forth and everything that we've had to go through with Lori. It has not been a, an easy time. It's not been an easy time for us either, the Future Lead Academy. Um, that time where it became difficult started 15 months ago. I signed my lease on 11 one of 2019 as a is a youth training center which was exactly what it was filed with the state government of california and the federal government as part of, and my ppm private placement memorandum for my investors is a youth training center and a tutorial academy that was also explained we went to the city to get our permits but let me back up to, to really where this story for, begins and i don't want to take a lot of time on this because i don't have a lot of time and i'm hoping to answer questions at the end i was informed after I signed my lease that a new that my neighbor which signed after me was going to be a dispensary. I found that out after I'd already signed mine a month and a half later. And that that was going to go to city council six months later. The issue we had at that point is that it became, it became somewhat of a battle at that point. We went to the city never being in this business before my nephew Brock Tybin went to the city city to the meet to the to the counter with Dan Garcia our general contractor and applied for the application to get our the build done. We, when we asked them specifically, do we need an SUP? What do we need? No, this is all you need. And they stamped our plans and we went to work. And then the battle started. I can probably guarantee that all the complaints for our construction or whatever it was came from Leaf Dispensary next door because we knew the battle was coming. Then COVID hit. 
I was in construction for four months up until April 27th when they held the city council meeting during the lockdown. So we were forced to go to a city council meeting during a lockdown when nobody was going to be able, the, the surrounding neighbors could not review the, the, uh, the information that Leaf Dispensary was trying to open. We went in there, we presented our case. And at that point, it was brought to our attention, do you have an SUP? And I said at that meeting, what are you talking about? Didn't know, we do not have an SUP. And I think I'm on record as saying that day, as if we will leave this meeting and I will do whatever it takes to work with the city, I will be a good partner. Whatever you need me to do, I will go do. I promise you that. And then for the next 30 days after that, they decided Leaf was not a suitable tenant. For the next 30 days, we over and over reached out to the city, did not hear back from the city until 6-3. On 6-3, we were told that we needed an SUP, the information that we needed for an SUP filing. We went ahead and filed that. Now, let me back up. Dan Garcia, who did the work according to the plans that were stamped by the city under what we expected, what we thought was correct, was then, I, I, I'm not in construction. I'm, I'm in the sales business and building brands and creating a, a, a place for youth to, be, to change their lives. That's what I do. It was informed to me, so we filed our SUP hearing sometime in June, or SUP application in June. It was accepted. We were given a, a letter um, confirming that. We were 30 days out from our SUP hearing. I had never heard a word from the city. I hadn't heard a word from anybody. 30, and let me back up too. We were told from the day the uh, City Council meeting was adjourned, all the way through May and June, nearly every single day, the city received a call that we were doing something incorrect for COVID or out of compliance. And we, through the grapevine, heard that that was Leaf Dispensary over and over and over again. And tonight, Lori Young said something to the effect that um, that she hasn't heard from anybody in forever, a long time. Well, from what I understand, they found another location. So she hasn't heard any complaints about us in months. But it's really odd that it was all back then. I'm not blaming anybody or casting any doubt because I do want to say this. We made a lot of mistakes early on. We made some critical errors in trusting this person at the counter. I made critical errors in trusting the GC to do his job correctly. And those were critical errors on our part. So I will take responsibility for that. What ended up happening in September is our SUP was uh, taken off the table because they were saying that we were not compliant with COVID. We were not... Uh, uh, that, our S that we didn't have our plans and permits stamped and signed off, and the inspection was fraudulently made up, which was absolutely ridiculous. When I found out Dan Garcia, my GC, handed me the inspection, the inspection report, had a name on it, we sent it to Ann, the code compliance officer, and I have an email back from her that says, got it, thank you. Never heard another word again. I'm under the impression everything's fine. Everything's good. Then I find out that nobody in the city has ever even seen this document before, never signed it. My G GC, when I asked about it, I have not heard from him since. I can't find him. So I fired him and I fired three people associated with that project at that time. And I, re got re re I hired new people to come in, it, create new plans and create a new, a, a new SUP filing with new parking report per the city's request of me to do and I even have maybe 15 or 20 emails to the city clearly asking, we want to work with you. Please come meet with us. I asked Patrick Ayer, Ayer sorry, <laughs> uh, please take a look at, please come meet with us. Let's sit down at your office. I want to just show you what we're doing. We want to create a, a good environment for the city. Please give this opportunity to us. Months would go by, no response. To 10 days, no response. Finally, Patrick said, we can't meet with you because the city's closed down. What kind of documents do you need to give us? And this went on forever, for three months. Then all of a sudden, the, my landlord finally came around and approved our SUP application back in September, October, right around there. And then it took another, it took all the way until, what, 45 days ago to get an SUP hearing. We had been ignored for two months back and forth with Lori Young, and it's not her fault, I'm not blaming Lori, we just had a lot of back and forth. We were changing as we went forward with the business to try and accommodate all the negative uh, remarks and things that had happened, we were trying to change it. All well, at the same time, we go back to uh, some things that Lori said here that uh, 
Uh, and, and let me just go back. I, want, I know there's not a lot of time left, and I hope I can keep talking because this is very, very critical to saving lives and the kids that we're involved with right now. So I hope you allow me to do that. The reality of it is this business model, we are not a school. The SUP uh, staff report is littered with inconsistencies and assumptions. And what I mean by that is this. We are not a school. We are not a gym. We are a private training facility that is not open to the general public. We are not a school. We happen to have a branding agreement with Deep Space Learning, which is a tutorial academy at 2475 Townsgate Road. Those, the kids that go to that school, to go to the tutoring academy, are not even in school with us. They are in, enrolled in online school called Enlightium. We have teacher facilitators who are tutors over there they, at that location. They're not teachers. They're not, we have no curriculum. We don't do that. So the so the so it's littered throughout the entire staff report that we're a gym and a school. We are neither. We are a training, a training center for kids, youth, and pro athletes, private training with private with private individuals. We are, and then the tutorial academy is just that. It's a hybrid. Kids come in with their own laptops. They open up their own um, their own uh, curriculum on Enlightium Academy or whoever else their private their uh, online school is. And if they have a question, they raise their hand. People will come over and help them. Two hours of training in our academy, and let me tell you this: we don't charge a single one of those kids one single penny. So when you're telling me that I'm in business, what does that mean exactly? I don't charge anybody a single dime yet. Every single one of those kids, whether we bust some kids in from Compton, Inglewood, okay, uh, our Mr. Source Harrison, I'm gonna have to stop you there. Um, that's your 15 minutes. Um, so I'd like to open it at this point uh, to commissioners' questions. If any, anyone has any questions at this point, uh, Mr. Newman, Mr. Newman, uh, Vice Chair Newman, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair Buss. And thank you to the applicant for your testimony. Um, we have some um, things that, there are things that we agree on uh, mutually. Um, we're both pro-education, we're both definitely pro-sports. So you've got some uh, agreement on there. Um, this is not the question, or these are not the questions before us this evening. The questions are whether the SUP application um, meets the five tests that are that that were required to consider to grant the application. And I've got a few questions about that application. Um, first off, the marketing materials from Future Elite Academy that were shown this evening um, made references to the word high school. Um, made references to core curriculum, math, English, science, and social studies. And those, those terms, particularly high school, sound an awful lot like school to me. So the question is, what's the difference between tutoring and school? And there we go. Who, Sorry about that, folks. Sorry. Uh, Yes, well, that's a great question. So um, we're not a school. A school has to be an accredited and have to have a, a, an accreditation. We do not have that. We're, we're, we're not an accredited school. We, we don't have any sort of accreditation. As I stated in my in my private placement memorandums and my filings with the state and with my filings with the government on a federal level, it doesn't say, even state that we're a school. So let me answer this specifically about the marketing. The marketing is very clear. Okay, that we, if you go to my website right now, you'll even see it says Enlightium Academy on it. Enlightium is the school provider that we offer people if they want to be involved in it, okay? But here's the thing. We do not teach the, the classes. If they do their online school, they're in an online class that they pay for. This, just like you would if you were at home. We just happen to provide a service with tutorial services. Now, the high school thing. So we, have an, we will never be in the high school space Ever. That is not our space. Our niche is seventh, eighth, and eighth grade reclassification. Now, what we, I think that might have been a little misunderstanding there um, about high school and that it was read incorrectly. I, I'd have to go back and look at it. I don't even remember that marketing piece. The, web, the website has the words high school indicating some future activity. Yeah. So, so I'm asking you about those words 
on future elite academies website yeah i'd have to take a look at that again because we have no intention of being a high school ever and we have no accreditation to do so in any way whatsoever and i don't think that that piece of marketing material states that that's what we're going to do but i'll have to take a look at that now to answer your other question um which was i'm sorry going back to your other question um about the marketing <laughs> Oh, the, oh, excuse me, the, the core curriculum and the, 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 the core math. Curriculum. And the, yeah. question, the question again is, what's the difference between tutoring and a school when, right. when you're talking about high school, you're talking about core core, core studies in English or social studies or again, like that? Where, it's, where is the line there? Help me understand where that sure, is. Sure, sure, sure. So we, again, I cannot provide classes. I cannot provide school. We do not do that. It's a... Uh, in Lydium Academy, in Lydium and Laurel Springs are a high level online platform. You have to pay for, just like if you took your online classes from Oaks Christian or whoever it is, that's their school. That's where they go to school every day. And I, at, the, at the Deep Space Learning Center, there's tutors that are there to answer questions if the student has a question in their school. Just like there's no difference between going to a Westlake High School and you're in that school and there's a tutor that can help you. That's the tutoring service. We're, we do not provide school. We're not accredited to be a school. We will never be a school. That's not part of our business plan. So, so this whole thing that we're running a school, we're not. We're running a tutorial service that has a training element with it. A training how element. How many services. hours per day does that tutoring service operate? It's four hours. Four hours, okay. Yep, okay. four hours. All right, let's move on. Um, either in the realm of uh, tutoring, let's call it, or athletics, um, is is future elite not not your partners, but future elite um, currently hosting customers, clients, students, whatever we want to call them? Um, are there activities underway right now at future elite? There's business operations on a daily basis with me and my staff. Uh, we have 26 employees there running the company and trying to get this thing off the ground. Um, the reality is, and to answer that question, um, you know, we have our student athletes that we pick up in South Central LLA and we bring them out here because they didn't have an opportunity to, to those, about 30 kids did not have an opportunity to have school this year. They didn't have any opportunity for a place to go and a place because they don't even have Wi-Fi. And these are elite athletes. So we provided a free service for them to come to our to our building and, and our in our tutorial service to be able to help them to get to the next level in high school so athletically. You're, athletically. you're saying you're saying, sir, that that there are school age kids using both athletic and tutoring facilities at your business at the yes, moment. That's okay. right. All right. And let me let me just also include this with that. We have been put in a horrible position with this whole thing. We, that we feel from the city. We got blocked on September from submitting plans. We were not allowed to submit any new plans. We were blocked. One side said that you need an SUP and the other side said you can't get permits until you have an SUP. The SUP side said you can't get an SUP until you have the permit. Permit side said you can't get an SUP unless, or permits until you get an SUP. And then we were shut down, blocked for trying to submit anything. That went on for months. So we were put in a position in the middle of a COVID pandemic, and I'm now two and a half million dollars later in this project. And we have been put off and put off and put off and put off and put off. And the communication has been very lax. Okay, so, sir, sir, my question was whether whether there are kids at your yeah, facility I got it. now. And I understand. Okay, I'm just trying you. to explain. I'm okay, just trying let's, to explain. Let's, let's move on. Um, the um, plans, um, the city received some plans some time ago and gave them a thorough review. And as you know, there is there is this whole process where city planning staff does a very extensive thorough review. And then and then we on the planning commission um, also read every word of the document submitted and pour over the plans. And the plans that were submitted to we the commission uh, were done so some time ago. And We've since received about less than half an hour before our sound checks for this meeting began. Uh, we received a new set of plans that I presume are different. And my question to you is the following: um, Is it your preference that we 
instead look at the current plans, which we're really not permitted to do at this evening's hearing, because they're not part of this hearing. Because that, that would open the door to continuing this hearing to some later date. Or are the plans that were previously submitted the correct ones? No, we, the plan, what plan should we be looking at? Yeah, thank you so much for asking that. And um, the plans that were submitted uh, recently, as of today, are the correct actual plans for the, for the, for the operation. The exact square footage, the exact dimensions, and they are perfectly laid out. We have you tried said, to. You said, just so I understand, right. you said the plans were submitted today, Monday. So what happened was, is that we had submitted. So let's backtrack a little bit, okay? Hang on, no, no, no. Let's 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 go forward here. Yes, are the please. plans please. that you wanted on the second submission, the ones that you want this planning commission to review, sir? Are the ones submitted? Yes, recent, the most recent. Okay, then we need to stop right now because we just spent a half an hour going over plans that you don't want us to review and are not part of your business plan is what you're telling me. These are these plans were corrected and offered to, no, no, no. Tried to submit. I just yes. want to be sure. You were saying I want the to be clear on that, because that we have not looked at yet. None of us have had a chance to review are the ones that you want your business to be determined. This, uh, this, this to be reviewed. That is and correct. For us to be clear, the review process is much longer than half an hour. I'm just saying the public meeting I, part. I, 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 the, application, the application before us. Um, <laughs> man, I, man, I, I just, I, I, I've been were, in uh, one meeting prior to this, and uh, yes, I have also. May, may I just may I may I just speak to one point on that? The okay. only correction. Hold, hold on, just a moment, sir. Um, yeah. Let's let's be clear. There was a set of plans submitted by the applicant, um, your business. Um, city staff went through them for uh, weeks, and the planning commission, by law, has to get them. I think it's 72 hours prior to a public hearing. By practice, it's longer than that. It's five days before a public hearing. So it sounds like what we've all got reviewed for days slash weeks is different than what the applicant would like us to review. And I just wanted to be clear on there's a there's a disconnect there. We will we will make a determination with with in consultation with you as the applicant whether we should continue this hearing to a date to a future date or have an up and down vote on the application before us. But let me be very clear on this point. The application before us does not include the plans that were submitted today. I just want to be clear on that. You're 100 percent correct. Okay, okay. Chair, Chair Buss, if I may. Yes, please. This is, what, this is what I was speaking with about earlier when Mr. Newman brought it up uh, at the beginning of the presentation. So the concern we have, of course, is that you heard Mr. Sellers tonight talk about a number of things, and one of them was that he, his client was okay with the conditions that we, some, that, that we had for the resolution. If you were to approve this, doc, this uh, project, you would have to accept, they would accept those conditions. So the issue again is raised that if we do not have the current plans, the planning commission has no authority right now to approve the current set of plans that they, if Mr. Um, if the applicant is actually, if the applicant is actually saying that this is the plan today, the ones that were submitted half an hour ago are the ones that they want, okay? That is, that is important for all of you as commissioners to understand that you don't have authority to do that. The other concern is, and I appreciate the applicant's comments about this, is that staff, again, goes back to, I think Mr. Ms. Young actually said it a few uh, uh, hour or so ago, where she said, in March, end of March, we received a set of plans and from an architect, and we asked, what were these plans about? And they said, oh, that was a mistake. Ignore that. And one of the reasons why is because we were going to have to continue the hearing anyway, because we had those new plans, we we're going to have to review those. So that is a concern I have for you tonight. Once I heard Mr. Um, Brett, I'm sorry, Mr. Harrison, uh, state that tonight, as Mr. Newman brought out, these are the plans we want submitted. I think it goes back to the option that that we presented earlier that Mr. Newman clarified with me, and that is you either ask for continuance, and it can be to a date certain, or just we can reset the hearing. It doesn't either one, or we go forward with what the plans are that were reviewed a long time ago, and that's where we get the concern is that What's, you know, I don't know what those plans are today. I haven't seen them. I know staff hasn't seen them. If they have, 
but they need to do that analysis to ensure that whatever they are, they're, they can be presented to you with, with information so you can make a decision. So unfortunately tonight, you can't make a decision on, on, on the plans that they want you to understand. And at my, then my concern is if you were to approve this project, the conditions are based on the old set of plans. Which exactly. we go back into a circular situation that we have. And so, again, I'm just providing you that information. Uh, I think it is imperative that if, if we have these new plans and they are, and the applicant was clear that he wants us to consider, he wants you, excuse me, to consider those plans, uh, we have to have some time to go through them and present them in front of you. Mr. Heer, given, given that, how should we proceed here? I mean, yeah, I, I have questions. I'm sure other commissioners have questions on other parts of the application. But if, this, if the plan part of this is a showstopper, is it appropriate here to decide that we, to, to make a determination about a continuance so, with the applicant's permission? Or, right. or should we choose between that continuance and uh, go no go decision tonight? Or how should right. we proceed? So again, my recommendation would be to ask for the continuance now. And the only reason why is because I don't know what the questions you have. And I don't know if those questions are going to be changed based on the information that's presented when we have the new plans that they want us to review. So those are the two critical things. There are many other things. I know that there are a lot of people who are signed up tonight to speak, and I understand that as well. So I don't say this lightly, other than if, if the applicant wants you to look at those new plans, you cannot right now approve those plans because you haven't seen them and it's not appropriate for you to rule on those kind of plans. And so that's the, literally the basic element. I know we've talked about the school and on all that, but the, the biggest issue is the parking for the site and the use of the site that has been going on in, in staff's opinion and, 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 and from this information. But again, I think if they're really going to go forward with this, with the set of plans that they want right now, I, I think we would, I, I don't, I don't see the value of continuing it, but that's again for you guys to consider. I'm, I'm just giving you the information and my recommendation based on this new statement. So Mr. Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll see back. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll see the rest of my time back to you to make a determination. Yeah, I guess on let me, that. Well, let me go ahead and take the reins back here and consult with uh, Mr. Harrison and his attorney. Uh, Mr. Harrison, if you'd like to consult Mr. Uh, Mr. Sellers for a moment and determine what you guys would prefer to do at this point, um, I'd be happy to give you guys a moment. And it, it is important to note, uh, Chair Buss, that they have to one obviously agree to the continuance. I don't think we can do a date certain because I don't know for staff, I can't speak for staff, but I don't know what the plans need. So I would hate to say, oh, let's go to a date certain because we just don't know that. I, I will consult with uh, uh, Carrie Finley at that point and right. see what so, you so, um Again, my, my thought would be to continue it to a time that a mutually agreeable time with, with the applicant, if that's what the position is. And the final yes. thing is, based upon this applicant statement tonight, I would recommend that they officially state that they are withdrawing the old plans so we don't have that conflict. Over us. Okay, so uh, Mr. Harrison, I'm going to give you the floor for a moment um, to you. discuss with your attorney or, or tell us what you want to do here. Yeah, I'm going to call Let Mark. Me, you hear quick. me? Um, it, it shouldn't take long, but I just do want to make one statement. The new plans have no drastic changes to them. They were just a minor adjustment to uh, to a uh, door that they had placed in downstairs, but that door doesn't even exist. So I said, take it out. Uh, so so then these do you are want to just move on with the uh, with the application as I, it is. I think I'm going to call uh, Mark really quick. Um, I don't see the is he still on here? Uh, I, I was hoping yeah. he was, but I okay. I'm, I think Mr. Sellers, you there? Yes. Oh, there Mark, you are, Mr. You. Mr. Sellers. Okay. You've been following. Yeah. Yeah. I I have no problem with a a continuance. It's really up to Mr. Harrison uh, as to uh, that. Uh, but I think uh, just to make sure that what we have before the planning commission is exactly what's going to be improved is is important. Yeah. So. Okay. I, I think I think I might just to, I think that I'm I'm willing to move forward with this planning commission hearing tonight. Um, okay. You know, our, our these kids' lives depend on it. Um, my staff, my employees' lives depend on it. And the reality of it is, the the modifications to the plans are extremely minor, and the and they were really just uh, you know corrected so that I could get I can try to deliver those to the city 
uh, and get the permits stamped and ready to go. And we can get them to the place for inspections. And that was the biggest thing for me tonight. Uh, we're an open door. I just want I just want to work with the city. I want you guys in our place. Tell us what we need to do. I've been okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you one more time, Mr. Harrison. Would you like to continue this hearing or would you like to 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 re repeal this this set of plans and replace it with the other one and have a hearing at a future date? We're continuing the hearing. Okay, let's do it. Uh, Mr. 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 Chair, may I continue? I've got a yes, couple more questions. Vice Chair Thank Newman, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Harrison, um, in addition to the plans, uh, the chronology for the whole project also talked about permitting. And there was an episode where the city received a, a signed off permit for um, several items. I'm just going to review what they were. Um, that, that indicated that, that permit or that building inspectors had signed off on electricity and plumbing for which permits had previously been pulled and for uh, mechanical, which had never been applied for. And the city staff testified that it checked with all of the city's building inspectors and none of them had signed off on this. So my question is, where did these phantom signatures come from? So Dan Garcia, who is our GC, who um, I am happy to give his contact information to the city. Um, he uh, is the one that took care of this. He did the inspection. He, he, he what he, I was told was he had somebody come in, did the inspection, gave us the inspection, gave me the inspection report when I came back from out of town. I was out of town at the time. My nephew, Brock Tybin, who was running this operation, who no longer works for the company, uh, was working with Dan Garcia. Dan Garcia brought somebody in. He had a vest on. I mean, this is all detailed in our chronological order to uh, to the city back then, where we explained what went out, what actually went on, um, and we were given an inspection report with a signature on it. Okay, then it, is, it, Dan, it is Dan Garcia or your nephew a building inspector for the city of Thousand Oaks? No, absolutely not. Then who signed, the, who signed off on these permits? The gentleman that came into the facility and and said that he was the building inspector that had a yellow vest on. And so, and I wasn't there, so this is secondhand information for me. So Dan Garcia, who you're happy to call, and he he tells me that absolutely 1,000%, it was inspected and it was done. I since fired him since I couldn't get a, get, get a, get a reasonable uh, understanding of that. And I told the city when I heard from this back, I, we didn't hear about this until September. So I fired him and, I, and my, no, my nephew no longer works for the company and I got rid of everybody else that had anything to do with it and we started over. Because okay. I found out this. All right. So we don't we don't know who signed off on who. We don't know. know. Okay. All right. Yeah. And my final question is for the uh, parking study that was done. Um, who commissioned that study? Was it you or the city? So the city came to me and said, "You need to get a parking analysis. The, your parking analysis, the, due to your, your your business scope, you need a parking analysis." So twelve thousand dollars later, with Walker consultants we provided the parking analysis which was accepted and, and we were and given you, our you you as the applicant commission that study yes sir that's all i have mr chair no more questions thank you sir thank you uh if, if i may chair bus chair bus excuse yes, me yes, just sure. to, just to be clear because we used uh unfortunately we used the word continuance a couple of different ways so i just want to have clarity that i understand from the continuing questions from Mr. Newman, that we are continuing with the hearing tonight and staying with the old set of plans. So I need the record to be very clear. And if you would ask the applicant that he is withdrawing his new set of plans that were submitted apparently half an hour before the meeting. So we don't have, I just need clarity for that because- Okay, I just, well, just to clarify, Mr. Harrison, you understand that we are going based upon the plans as were presented by the city staff to us. Well, I have a question for you on that. Okay, go ahead. In light of everything that's gone on with the city so far, and a lot of misinformation that we've been given, I'm a little apprehensive to agree to old plans, and then I go to submit the new plans for my, my new permits that I have to have to get my current inspections and get approved by the city, saying these don't match what you were approved for. Uh, I think the safest is to continue the hearing <laughs> on an open hearing basis to a date certain so that and uh, make the decision based on the plans that are accurate and most recently submitted. 
That's Mr. Sellers speaking. Chair, uh, Chair Mr. Buss, if, if I might interject. Yes, Mr. Link, please. So the the two, I, I think, uh, issues at hand here are with regard to use within an M1 zone and the parking study. So Correct. the tenant improvements, uh, which, uh, and Ms. Finley, please correct me if I'm wrong, and, and Mr. Hay here, uh, can be handled with an administrative approval after the fact if we're talking about a door. So the plans, the, the, the space that is designated office, that is gross floor area, that is uh, training use or gym use, however, whatever you want to call it, is not changing substantially. So we can make a determination based on that this evening that this everything that all the information that we've been provided tonight is within substantial conformance of the prior plans and planning can approve any changes to a door after the fact commissioner link we are all both of on that understanding but i have not reviewed them so i am not sure if that information is accurate or not and, and i'm relying just, on both the applicant and mr sellers and mr hayer to tell us right. that M mr chair if i may yes i just want to i want to reiterate the question i asked at the outset and that mr hayer Mr. Heher answered affirmatively, which is that the plans before us are and only are those submitted with as part of this with the agenda. We are not considering what was what was submitted today is out of scope and is not part of our decision making process. We need that, to Clear That's that exactly point. what I wanted to say, which is that we cannot make any commitment one way or the other to any plans that aren't in front of us. Period. As a planning commission, we are we are only here to review what is in front of us, and so, Mr. Harrison, uh, I I cannot make you any guarantees about anything else you have going on. I can only tell you that we can review what we have in front of us. Right. Based right. On the information but the, 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 the kind, I feel the slight the slight contradictory to that is Patrick just asked me to confirm something uh, based on the old plans, but then I go to submit the new ones to the city because they're going to require those for my inspection and my permits. And then the city says, no, you can't do those because you have to walk the old ones. You see my, 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 the problem I'm in right now, because this has happened already for a year. Yeah. So, uh, okay. okay. If, I may, if I may, Chair Buss, just to cut to the chase here. Yeah. You know, I don't want to keep on going back and forth. It's not for me at this time to debate what the applicant's position is and how the city is reacting to it, because that's not going to do us any good tonight. What I would say is that it's very simple for me that they had plans that they submitted. We worked, staff worked on those plans, and that is what's before you tonight. As stated earlier, there were new plans that were submitted at the end of March that we asked about, and they said, forget those, that, that was a mistake. And apparently, those were not a mistake, or no, they have like to address that. that. It doesn't matter. The bottom, the bottom line is, is that there are new plans. Staff has not looked at them. Commissioners have, haven't looked at them. And with respect to all the comments, the concern I would have is if you were to approve this this project tonight, it would be based on the conditions that were based upon the plans that were submitted. And to the applicant's comment about another set of plans, at the end of the day, yes, we're going to be going based on the plans, and we don't want those plans changed. We want you to make a decision based on the plans that they're representing. So that is important that we have that clarity, because yes, the, the initial receipt that we have was a warehouse with a bathroom change. That was what we received, and that's when Again, before leave, and we started getting to leave, which again is a non-issue, except for the fact that there was a understanding that they had a project, and now it turned out to be a gym. And so once that happened, that's when all this effort, extra work goes into a special use permit. And that's just, unfortunately, those are the, the factors that we have tonight. Well, I, I, let, me, let, me, let me just state one thing about the uh, 322 delivery of uh, ed, new, an additional SUP in the plans. Our architect on her own, without my approval of any of the plans or an additional SUP application, filed that with the city. And that is verifiable. And I just found that out a week later when Laura Young called me, she, or she sent an email to me and Mark and said, hey, did, why did you submit a new SUP filing with new plans? And I said, what are you talking about? And I went, so I was never CC'd on this, never had any of it. My architect sent them direct, direct. I looked at them. And there were some inconsistencies with the walls and a couple of doors and two offices upstairs. I called Lori and I said, Lori, no, please do not submit this. This is not accurate. I have to have the door changed and I will get it back, the, the new ones in. That's what happened. So here we are. And again, Chair Buss, again, I, 
I don't need to be in a point where I'm arguing with the applicant here. This is just yeah, not giving you yeah, that I, 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 I'm speaking yeah, to you, I, Chair. I, I absolutely comprehend what you're saying. So I want to defer to Commissioner McMahon here for a moment, who's been waiting patiently to speak. Uh, you are muted, Commissioner McMahon. Excuse me. Okay, this is what I'm witnessing right now. Um, we as commissioners are very unsure of what we're going to be voting on because we just briefly glanced at these new plans. Also, uh, our applicant is very unsure of where he stands because if we, as, as I understand what he's just said, if we do approve this and then he submits the plans he wants, he doesn't feel comfortable that he's going to get the, the permit that he wants. So in my mind, we have no choice but to continue so that everybody knows that we're all on the same page. And uh, with that, I'd like to make a motion that we continue this to a date uncertain. I believe that we're not allowed to make that motion. <laughs> we're in an open hearing still. Yeah, we're in an open okay, hearing well, still. The only person okay, can well, continue. In that the only case, person that can ask for a continuance is the applicant. All right. Well, I will ask the applicant, um, seeing as how you are not sure about what's going to happen because of your plans and the changes and this and that, do you not think it's a good idea that we are all on the same page and we do this when we are all on the same page. Yeah, ma'am, ma'am, I appreciate that comment. Thank you so much. But, but let me just take that one step further. Um, I would be okay with the continuance if there was some assurance that the new plans that I'm going to deliver will be accepted and looked at based upon the decision making tonight, as long as there's no major contradictions to what we're asking. Mr. Harrison, I have to tell you this. Uh, the yeah. reason that you are at a hearing is because there is no assurance. Okay. All right. So uh, this is not a guarantee the commission can make. Makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. So, so based upon that information, how do you feel at this point? Mark? Yeah, I agree. And I don't know why you couldn't continue this on an open hearing basis to a date certain unless uh, there is no date certain or to an I uncertain date to be noticed. And I agree that let's continue it so that everybody is on the same page uh, with regards to these plans. All right. So legal counsel is telling you that it's probably a good idea. What do you think, Mr. Harrison? I have one more question before I answer that. Yes, please. Um, I would like the opportunity to deliver those plans to the, to the uh, permit uh, division and get those plans uh, rather than having this stonewalling of you got to do this before you can do that. And then the other part where it says that, I'd like to deliver those to the correct departments, the permitting department, the planning department, have the, because that's not been allowed yet. Okay, uh, Lori Young, um, is he going to be able to have uh, uh, interaction with you to make sure that he gets everything he needs to the right people? Excuse me, Chair Buss, I'd like to, um, to interject oh, here sure. for a minute. Yes, sir. Uh, we have a, a virtual submittal. He can submit his plans electronically. We can take those in and add that to the new uh, application or the revised application. The uh, stonewalling I think he's referring to is the fact that we cannot issue a building permit for an unpermitted use. So you can't do tenant improvement work for a plan that we may or may not approve. The Planning Commission has discretion over that. We do not, at, administratively at least. So okay. we, do not, we do not allow, as a matter of practice, um, uses that are not authorized to come in for tenant improvement work. And that's just a, that's just a matter of practice. And it's a good practice. Um, we, it's just like we don't, we encourage people or future tenants to not sign a lease before they have a, a permit. That's a- Understood. Yeah. So um, Mr. Harris, and does that uh, answer your question, sir? <laughs> a little bit, I guess, <laughs> a little bit. Um, and I'm not trying to be difficult, I'm really not. I just, this is such an important and critical situation um that's been going on for 17 months and two and a half million dollars later that, it's very you know, clear to me yeah there, there's a, you put a lot of things in motion and now are finding out that there are a lot of hurdles that you have to overcome and i am empathetic to that that is that is a you. challenging position to be in thank you and, i appreciate and that really what we're trying to do as the planning commission is trying to make sure that at least you are pointed in the right direction and get thank you. And, and get what you need to get thank you for that um so uh, i would like to request that uh we get a specific date to right now all right, perfect. Let me check and see if, uh, with uh, uh, Carrie Finley, if uh, if that would be possible, if we can set a, a future date. 
I have a pending question out there. Um, Mr. Heer? Yeah, my, my recommendation earlier was that we do not set a date certain just because we have to look at the plans and we're not going to pick a date and have the same thing happen again. So, gotcha. again, my recommendation was to not pick a date certain and have it re-noticed and do that process to be clear. Uh, but it's up to the chair what they want to do and and we'll go, and for staff as well. But that's not really, I mean, it's really for staff to make a decision at the end of the day. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I, that, that's a little beyond my uh, scope because I don't know what our scheduling is or how we can stay legal here. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Newman, you got uh, some advice for me? <laughs> I do. Um, I, I want to concur with Mr. Heher in that um, we want to give the applicant an opportunity to have the plans and indeed the entire application be the application that the applicant wants. What we're hearing tonight is that the plan component of the application is not the plan that the applicant wants. And there's more flexibility if we go the date uncertain route to give the applicant every opportunity to dot every I, cross every T, make sure that all components of the application, including the plan, are the ones that the applicant wants. And by the way, we don't know tonight whether that plan may be the one that's already in the application or the one that was just received today or some hybrid of the two in the future. But by giving more flexibility of an uncertain date, um, the applicant has more of a chance, in my view, to get everything working together. So I'll address that just very briefly and I appreciate everybody's patience, thank you. Um, the issue is this. Um, I was told in November we would have our SUP hearing in January, and it's now April. So I waited five, four, four or five months, and we made a couple of corrections on the plans. The plan, the business model, and what we're doing with the business, okay, has not changed. It is consistent, and it will stay consistent as a training center and tutorial center. Okay. Hello? Sorry. May I, may I clarify something? Yes, yeah. um, I also would concur that we probably want to do a date uncertain because we have to review the plans. The analysis is based on what the floor area says and what the zoning requires. And that leads to conditions of approval. And typically what staff will, staff will do is give the conditions of approval to the applicants and their team to look over prior to them coming back to plan commission and to, so that we have a consensus of whether or not they agree with those conditions. Um, makes sense. That's typical that makes process, sense. and it might take more time than than we can, um, you know, predict at this point. All right, I saw Commissioner Lanson wave at me briefly. <clears throat> I, I just thought I would join the uh, discussion. Finally, um, you know, one of the problems, Mr. Harrison, is that this should, we should be the final part of this process, not an ongoing negotiation. So it's better for you to get everything and all the ducks in a row and bring the entire package to us so that we can look at it so we don't have another continuance to the extent that all of a sudden there's changes or other things that happen at that point. So it's much better idea to get the uncertainty, even though I know you want certainty, but it can know that now we obviously are having this process. It will be dedicated towards getting everything done so we have a complete package so that we can say yes or no and give you that definitive decision, again, without having to maybe even continue it again if something is missing. Okay. And I, I appreciate that. And again, you know, I, we just want to do this right. We just want to be a good partner to the city. That's all we want uh, at the end of the day. So I just want that open line of communication to be able to deliver whatever it is that we need to do. I just, that's, we just have to do that. And I just, I just want to make that really clear. You got it. Then, um, Mr. Harrison, are you comfortable with an open-ended? I am. Okay. Then, um, I say we go ahead and continue this uh, open-ended at this point. Uh, thank you very much for your time, Mr. Harrison. I thank you very thank much you, for the public speakers who probably waited very patiently at this point. Uh, <laughs> your opinion is very valuable and uh, means a great deal to us. And I hope that you'll be back for us when we do revisit this uh, this topic and uh, and give Mr. Harrison his hearing. I thank, thank you so you. much to everybody tonight. I appreciate you all. All right. Um, I am going to move on now to uh, commission comments and AB 1234 reports. So now's the time for comments and uh, AB 1234 reports. Are there any comments from my fellow commissioners? I saw everybody with their hand up earlier. So now you all have time to talk. Who wants to go first? Commissioner Newman. 
Yes, thank you, Chair. I just want to mention briefly that that the Chair and I both attended Planning Commissioner Academy uh, virtually in the past couple of weeks. And um, I've previously attended it. Um, I have to say uh, there's definitely something lost in the virtual route. Um, I, I miss meeting commissioners from all over the state face to face, but nonetheless, there were still some very good sessions, including um, a very good session on current legislation that's pending that may have uh, very significant impacts on housing here in Thousand Oaks. And Chair Bess, Chair Bess, yes. if I may, I, I truly apologize just because of everything that happened tonight, I was a little bit off my game apparently. You actually do need to do a motion to continue oh. the matter. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, do we need to go back to uh, open? No, just, no just, do a, just do a motion. Okay. I'd like uh, to, uh, does anybody want to give the motion? I think Commissioner McMahon uh, pulled that one first. <laughs> So oh, I was off my game because I did it at the wrong time. So I'll do it now, which is apparently the right time. Um, so I move that we continue that matter until a date uncertain. Uh, uh, Secretary, please prepare us for a vote. Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner Buss? Aye. Commissioner Link? Yes. Commissioner McMahon? Yes. Commissioner Newman? Aye. I'm sorry, that was chair bus. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> Motion carries 5-0. Thank you so much. I apologize to the applicants for not following proper parliamentary procedure, but I'm glad we corrected it. Thank you, Mr. A here. Uh, moving on, uh, thank you, Mr. Newman, for your comment. Um, who else would like to speak? Any commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Lanson. I'll use my usual time to, to advise. We're now in the orange tier with regard to COVID. Uh, we had over the weekend about 40 uh, infections per day, uh, which is, is, is okay. It's, it's more than we had. So we're kind of going up again. So again, please be diligent with regard to wearing masks, being social distance. Even if you have your, your vaccination, which is great, still honor those things because again, we wanna make sure that we have those numbers down so that we can do this meeting in person <laughs> pretty soon so we can have a chance for all the public to come uh, be part of the process. Thank you, Commissioner Lanson. Uh, Commissioner Lee? Commissioner I have nothing further. I, I actually had a comment about the uh, the last uh, hearing item, so I've, I've got nothing for this evening. You got it. Commissioner McMahon? The same thing. I was going to uh, say something to the applicant, but I don't believe he's still with us, so. You got it. All right, then uh, I also want to follow, um, as Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Newman expressed, um, I attended a Planning Commission conference uh, virtually um, this past week or two weeks ago now. And uh, I am hopeful that uh, the information that I that I gleaned from that uh, meeting will aid me in, uh, in uh, with my hand on the tiller here as, <laughs> as a member of our Planning Commission in the city of Thousand Oaks. Um, so, and with that, we'll move on. Uh, staff update. Uh, Ms. Finley, are there any follow-up items, announcements, or upcoming issues? Um, yes, thank you. For announcements, um, the next general plan-related meeting will be a combined community meeting and general plan advisory committee meeting on April 21st um, to review the preferred land use alternative. Excellent. Also, um, a reminder that the full schedule for the general plan update of upcoming events is posted on the general plan update website, which is, again, www.toaks2045.org. And then these events also include opportunities to provide comments, including a much more focused survey on the preferred land use alternative that is scheduled to be available also on the the TOX 2045 website by the end of this week. Thank you very much, Ms. Finley. I also noticed that there was an excellent Instagram post advertising that new survey. So thank you very much for that. Um, also, Ms. Finley, can you report on any upcoming planning commission meetings? Um, yes, the next meeting is scheduled for April 26th. And again, it's gonna be the general plan update team bringing forward the preferred land use alternatives for discussion, comments, and recommendation to the city council. 
Um, and that is the last scheduled item we have right now for planning commission. But of course we have one that's being continued and we'll get that back as soon as we can. That concludes my updates. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you all. Uh, the meeting is now officially adjourned until the next meeting of April 26th, 2020 at 6 p.m. Thank you for watching.